This meeting is called to order. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the City of Boynton Beach City Commission meeting. Today is January 3rd, Tuesday, 2023, and the time is now 6 p.m. Before we begin with roll call, I just want to remind everybody the rules of civility and decorum. Members of the commission, please wait to be addressed by the chair uh, and not interrupt a speaker. Comments from the public must be addressed to the commission as a whole and not to any individual on the dais. Any sorts of insults or personal attacks will be strictly prohibited. Also, any disruptive behaviors from the audience, yelling, stamping of feet will also be prohibited. Upon warning, should these rules be continued to be violated, you may be asked to be removed from the chambers. So please govern yourselves accordingly. Let's now proceed to the roll call. Madam Clerk. Mayor Penserga. Here. Mayor Cruz. Present. Commissioner Hay. Here. Commissioner Turkin. Present. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. We're going to move on with the invocation by Pastor David Wiggins, St. John's Missionary Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Vice Mayor Angela Cruz. Let's all stand for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Almighty God, as you are known by many names and beyond all names, spirit of life, spirit of love, spirit of community, spirit of justice. We pause to recognize your omniscience, your steadfast protection, and most of all, your faithfulness. You've watched over us and kept us. You've protected us and our families near and far. You've allowed us to assemble again to conduct the business of this city. We ask your continued blessings on the people who have been called to lead Boynton Beach. Help them to remember, irrespective of political, religious, and social organization, they are not only leaders, but also servants, and that is their responsibility and ours to serve for the common good of all. Remind them that no matter where we live, everyone, regardless of our background, is our neighbor, our sibling, and that throughout the ages, prophets have called the leaders of the people to respect and protect the least of those among us, our children, the elderly, the hungry, the homeless, those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, the strangers and immigrants in our midst, those who live on the margins, those who are alone, those who are forgotten. We pray not only for the elected officials, we also pray for those who rush to trouble when people run away. We ask your continued protection on our first responders and our teachers and students and all those who work towards a better Boynton Beach. Grant them and us the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right, good, and true. May they and we speak out when it is time to speak out and listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May they and we always be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of justice, and more importantly, the spirit of God's love. Amen. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And Pastor Wiggins, that was beautiful. Thank you. We're now moving on to agenda approval, additions, deletions, and corrections. As for myself, I received a request from council to move up item 12A, 12A to move it to right after 7A, that would be the end of consent agenda items. So again, we're moving up 12A to right after 7A after consent agenda. And that's the only request I've received. Is there anything else from my colleagues? Let's begin with Commissioner Kelly. Additions, deletions, or corrections. Um, Mayor, I would like to add to future agenda items um, a review of the advisory board ordinance. Um, I've had some conversations with staff and there's some some questions that they have that aren't answered in there. And as far as uh, different advisory board requirements and uh, how many boards they can serve on and things like that. So I'd like to put that on future agenda items, please. 
All right. Anything else? Let's go, Commissioner Turkey. I'd like to um, table AA. And then I'd also uh, like to ask staff to look into a couple things. I'll start with um, looking into an ordinance for uh, it's a, a tent for paraphernalia shops. I have received a lot of feedback for uh, the smoke shop over there on Federal Notion. It's an eyesore. I'm hearing it from constituents, visitors, moms, dads, and tourists that, you know, it's it's not it's not the great representation of our city right in the downtown corridor. Um, I'd also like staff to look into uh, having a downtown policing unit. And then in addition to looking in, I know we just uh, approved a facial recognition software, I believe by Axon is the vendor, looking to make sure we can, I don't know if we would go through an ordinance or um, what the course of action would be to get compliance with all the small businesses to be able to um, uh, be able to use that mechanism with the software. Um, this is something that I've spoken to some of the officers about. So maybe Chief DeGiulio, if um, you could look into that. And uh, I guess we'd work with legal um, as far as what would need to be done. And then, um, you know, if if we have a way to make it economically friendly for smaller businesses, I think that'd be great as well. All right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Turkin. A couple of things I just want to make sure we have some clarity. I, I got we, one more. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'd also like staff to partner with uh, the PD and um, the Castro family and looking into doing some type of um, memorabilia or, you know, something to do to honor his name, um, whether that be, a you know, renaming a park, you know, statue, whatever that may be. All right, and then I'd also I'd, I'd also like <laughs> one to more thing. Uh, last thing I'd also like to just congratulate Chris Lemieux and all the other lieutenants and promotions uh, within the fire department from this last cycle. Okay, that's that's it. Final answer. Okay, I got it. All right, so I just want to make sure we have some clarity in all those items. Uh, Commissioner Turkin, you mentioned uh, tabling item eight A. I'd like to ask that uh, we you, you make that motion when we get to 8A at the very beginning, if that's all right. Sure. Um, you brought up tenting for paraphernalia shops. Uh, I'd like to have a discussion so I understand what exactly you mean by that, which paraphernalia shops, what kind. Uh, I wanna get some of the details of that. That's very interesting, but I wanna know more. Uh, so if uh, there's no objection from my colleagues, I'd like to have that discussion next meeting. Sure. Okay. A uh, downtown police unit, you'd like to have a downtown police unit? Yes. Would that be separate from the currently the CRA? Yes. What kind of police unit were you thinking of? So uh, I to, think to, you know, to do what goals? Right. So. Yeah, um, so, so I think something in our corridor, our downtown corridor of Federal and Ocean Avenue, you know, I get a lot of uh, concerns from some of the small businesses over there that there's vagrants at Dewey Park. I know the PD has done a great job with getting some more security cameras over there, um, but I think this is important as we grow and as we work to make our downtown more vibrant, that we can ensure that it is safe, you know, for businesses that do want to come in. And as we grow with the continued development downtown, um, we're not playing catch up down the road. Absolutely, Commissioner. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, hearing you, it doesn't sound like that's a resolution or an ordinance. It sounds more like we want to hear from the police chief an update of what the action plan may be for the downtown. Did I interpret correctly what yeah, you're- Yeah, that, that, that's fine. And there may be one already. Um, okay. But if not, maybe we can have something that that is um, assigned to that corridor. All right. And the last item I heard was some sort of memorial to honor uh, Dennis Castro, Sergeant Dennis Castro. I'm not sure if staff is already working on that, but if not, that's a wonderful idea to pursue. Yeah, I've been uh, speaking with uh, the PD. We're uh, looking at different avenues, so we enjoy your input. Obviously, it's a collaborative effort. Um, just trying to get something to actually memorialized Dennis's uh, memory. So, all right, excellent. Thank you. And anything else? No, good to go. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Cruz, any additions, deletions, corrections from you? 
If possible, I'd like to move item 8A after um, 12A, which would be 7C. You want to move 8A, that's our quasi-judicial item, to say that one more time. To if after, we can do that, right after 12A, which would be under 7C. I thought we were talking we about table in 8A. We would have to table it at the moment that it comes up. Yeah, I know. That's what yeah. you have to probably be. So I'm moving it up prior to public comment. Okay. Yep. 6A to right after 7A. Uh, 8A. 8A. 8A, which is the one we talked about tabling. We may have different versions of the agenda because I know the numbering may uh, have oh. changed because I'm a little confused. We're talking about the quasi-judicial item, the variance, item 8A. And you want to move it up to? After 7. Yeah, we already moved up 12A, and she wants to put it after. Right eight, after 12A. Eight, eight, eight. Okay. Right. All right, just making sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, anything else, Vice Mayor? No. Nope. Uh, Commissioner Hay? Uh, no, I thought we, we are talking about uh, additions and deletions and corrections to the agenda, right? Yes. Well, okay. I, I guess uh, based on what I've heard already, I like really to, to get an update, if not an update, um, uh, start thinking about additional uh, cemetery land for the city of Boynton. As most of us know, we are out of plots, uh, sites, uh, whatever you want to call it, grave sites that were bright and the one up in, on uh, Seacrest is uh, quite expensive so we as a city need to start looking where would we uh you know find land or what are we going to do about that because it is a serious problem for for our citizens so i would like that to be uh in the future to look, to look at i think that's an excellent question commissioner um thank you for bringing that up and i look forward to hearing from staff of what their ideas may be and how we can uh prepare for that in the future. Was there anything else, Commissioner? There's one other thing I, I would like to, to say at this point, I probably could say it later, but uh, as most of us know, uh, uh, Bishop Bernard Wright uh, was in a very serious uh, accident on December 26th. And he has many, many broken bones and is in the hospital uh, at Derry uh, Community. Uh, I was down last night with the family. So uh, it, with the permission uh, uh, of the mayor and, and other my colleagues, I would just like to call for a moment of silence now. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That's all I have. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, before us are a series of amendments. If there's nothing else, we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I moved. Second. Second. We have a motion from Vice Mayor Cruz. I heard a second from Commissioner Turkin. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. The agenda has been amended. Moving on to informational items by members of the City Commission. Now we'll begin in reverse order with Commissioner Hay. Uh, I have no concern. I mean, uh, nothing for me for this year. I just wish everybody a happy new year. And uh, we have a new year now to get things uh, uh, going again like we did last year. And hopefully everybody enjoyed their holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yep, same thing. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I do have a disclosure to make. I spoke with Jeff Burns from Affiliated regarding number item number 8A. All right, Commissioner Turkin. Um, Happy New Year's, everyone. I also spoke with Affiliated regarding 8A. Um, and then I just have a question for staff. I sent an email earlier this morning around 10 a.m. about a concern that Amber Benjamin had over at Waco Go. I have not gotten a response about that. It concerning that the water was going to be shut off um, during a certain time frame. And uh, I'm not sure if there's some truth to that or not. This is over at the 500 Ocean Building. So if we could get some clarity on that, I'd appreciate that. 
you want to get we, someone reach out to her? No, I'll address it after the commission meeting. I'll make sure someone reaches out to her. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kelly. Uh, I also um, spoke with Jeff Burns from Affiliated, and I just um, I wanted to thank, take a minute to thank city staff. I had um, kind of at a last minute about a month ago uh, spoke to staff about the idea of doing um, some Christmas holiday baskets for uh, some of our uh, lower income students in the city and city staff rallied around it and we had we were able to give 85 baskets out to um, to children in our schools uh, and the city staff there was somebody from every department the city library did all the shopping and our city clerk they shopped and they filled baskets and so I thank the you know my colleagues who help support this with community funds um, next year the city staff is excited to make it bigger next year so we're excited about that and I just wanted to say thank you and just recognize uh, our our great city staff in, in taking charge of that project. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Kelly, that's a perfect segue because in, additioning to, in addition to honoring staff for the work they did there, I do want to read this letter from a resident. And uh, as many of you know, I try to make it a habit to recognize the work that happens behind the scenes. We have excellent staff. Uh, this letter reads, I'm a resident of the Nautica Sound community in Boynton Beach and recently had a water issue that was flooding my backyard. I cannot tell you how grateful and impressed I was with the service your staff supplied me during this time. From that staff that received my call to Andre Tooks that came to my house to check the issue, I couldn't ask for better service. Wanted to make sure you were aware that if it wasn't because of their help, I could not have identified the issue that was created from a broken irrigation pipe in the community. I also want to acknowledge the staff that works for sanitation and recycling departments. I don't get to see them often because of my work hours, but when I do, I'm always impressed with their courtesy and good attitude. Please make sure that they know that their excellent service does not go unnoticed. Best regards, Monica Crezzo. So I wanna thank Andrew Tooks, who is a locator in meter services in our utilities department. Uh, Mr. Tooks has worked for the city for 16 years. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Tooks, and uh, hats off to you, sir. In terms of informational items, that concludes that. We're now going to move on to announcements, community and special events, and presentation. The first one is an announcement regarding the 51st Annual Holiday Parade Awards by Gabrielle Favita, Events Division Manager. So I'd like to call up Gabby. All right. We call her Gabby. Good evening, Mayor and City Commissioners. My name is Gabrielle Favita, and I'm the Events Manager for the City of Boynton Beach. The Events Division is excited to announce the award recipients for the City of Boynton Beach's 51st Annual Holiday Parade that took place in downtown Boynton last month. We had so many amazing entries this year, 55 to be exact, including local marching bands, school clubs, dance teams, community organizations, car groups, and much more. To no su surprise, when having so many great performances, many categories tied for first place. So tonight, I'll be announcing the winners individually and listing each category that they won. Beginning with, and we're joined by them today, the Boynton Beach Garden Club, who won Outstanding Depiction of Life in Boynton Beach. Do you want to do pictures after? or? We can do pictures after. You can make all your announcements and we'll come down. Okay, okay, perfect. Yep. I know you have a lot to announce. So. <laughs> um, following that, the Boynton Beach Community High School won Outstanding Depiction of Life in Boynton Beach as well. Max M. Fisher Boys and Girls Club of Riviera Beach Drill Team won Outstanding Display of Fantasy and or Imagination, Outstanding Display of Showmanship, and Most Creative. Mm -hmm. Suncoast High School Charger Sonic Sound Marching Band won music, Outstanding Musical Performance, Outstanding Use of Innovation and Technology, Outstanding Artistic Design, 
outstanding display of fantasy and or imagination, most whimsical and most creative. Royal Palm Beach High School Groove Marching Band, who won outstanding musical performance, outstanding display of fantasy and or imagination, outstanding display of showmanship, most creative. Finally, Faith's Place Center for Arts Education Incorporated Band, who won outstanding musical performance, outstanding display of entertainment, outstanding display of showmanship. Additionally, just this morning, the winner of the People's Choice Award, a social media campaign which allows the public to vote on their favorite group, is Krista McAuliffe Middle School's Students Working Against Tobacco Club and Student Council. Finally, the moment we've been waiting for, the Mayor's Cho Choice Award. The winner of the 2022 Holiday Parade Mayor's Choice Award is Congress Middle School. Thank you to all those who participated in this year's Holiday Parade and congratulations to our winners. We hope to see everyone Monday, January 16th at the 2023 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Participants will meet in Carolyn Sims Park uh, Continental Breakfast supplies and service hours will be provided, followed by the 2023 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration taking place at Sarah Sims Park from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Come hungry, there will be food vendors for purchase plus entertainment children's activities, including basketball clinics held by the Police Athletic League and a nonprofit showcase. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I believe there were uh, some representatives here today. If you'd like to take a group picture, I'd love to do that with you and any other members of the commission that would like to join me. I saw the Garden Club I know was the back Garden there. Club, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, come on, guys, let's do it. And yes. Yeah. And then sure. Boynton Everyone. Beach High School, perfect. And Max M. Fisher emailed me they were coming. Okay. okay. I think we should do it. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's do it. Hey, this is the Garden Club group. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We had a great time. <laughs> All right, Boyd Beach High School, guys, one more. You get all of us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is an announcement regarding chlorine flushing maintenance of public water supply from January 5th through the 25th, 2023, uh, to all City of Boynton Beach utilities customers. Uh, this announcement is a little bit lengthy, and I do want to read it, so it's in for the record, so do bear with me. Uh, the City of Boynton Beach Water Utility will be temporarily changing its water treatment disinfection process to free chlorination beginning Thursday, January 5th through Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. This is a uh, standard practice in which a stronger disinfection method is implemented in order to ensure that potable water uh, is delivered to customers of the highest quality. A slight change in odor and taste of potable water may occur during this period. However, the city's drinking water distribution system will continue to meet all federal and state water quality standards. And uh, 
Andrew, Mac, did you want to add an, an, add anything else or that pretty much summarizes everything? All right, great, we've completed that announcement. Now we're gonna move on to public audience and I wanna remind all of you that each individual gets three minutes and uh, this is not a Q&A, this is a time for you to be heard, so we're gonna listen and the timer is up behind us and please don't forget to state your name for the record. Please begin when you're ready. David Katz, City of Boynton Beach. Um, I'm gonna talk about the candidacy of Mr. Joe Josman. I went to the supervisor elections office this week and um, go to find out when he registered to vote, he gave the address 1521 Northeast Second Street. That was in 2008 when he registered. Interesting enough, everything that gets mailed to him concerning all the documents from the supervisor elections goes to an address at 6376 Country Fair Circle in the county in Boynton Beach. So because of that, I decided since the last commission meeting to drive out there. I've driven out there 14, 15 times. Other people have to back up what I'm gonna tell you. I've driven out there 11 o'clock at night, six o'clock in the morning. And guess whose car is parked at that address since then and probably before and lives in the county. On uh, October 14th, his campaign treasurer uh, appointment, which he has to give his address, he gave it as 212 Northwest 12th Avenue, never lived there. On 11-15-2022, his qualifying checklist, he gave the same address on 12th Avenue. 11-15-2022, the residency requirement, he signed that. And the address that he's given for his board appointment, which was not the truth, was 1521 Northeast 2nd Street. He's also floated 260 North Palm Drive, Boynton Beach in the city, never lived there. He's also given a PO box recently, because nobody can live in a PO box, we know that. And, and it's just not right. We're also gonna have um, a report from a licensed private investigator verifying the things I've just told you. And the city clerk needs to decertif decertify this man's candidacy. He does not live in the city. His candidacy is a fraud. And as we used to say in the Bronx, he's a fugazi. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Mike McCray, 806 Northwest 4th Street, Boynton Beach, Florida. I lived in Boynton for 69 years. I'm 73 years old. I lived in Point Santa Heights on Northwest 12th Avenue. 212 was owned by the Harrises. The next family was the Norfices. Then next was the Mikes, the Gambles, the Smiths, and then my parents, the McCrays, then the Harringtons, and also the Majors. I send to say all of this is because the city of Boynton, we have a charter. I hope all of you that's sitting up there swore you have read the charter. One of those requirements states that you must live the district for a year. Okay, let me move on. It's amazing, people don't know who you know. But I know the Harrises. I made a phone call to Kathy Harris, who was the former principal of Congress Middle School. I'm gonna give to the clerk tonight. She can give you all a copy. You know, when you're gonna run for office, you might as well be honest. I'm gonna tell you all right now, if you're gonna start off, start off at least by telling the truth, not by lying. I'm 73 years old. I can speak the way I wanna speak. This letter's from Kathy Harris. I'm gonna read it for the records for this city. And it says, Kathy Harris, owner of 212 Northwest 12th Avenue, Boynton Beach, Florida. To whom it may concern, my name is Kathy Harris, and I am the widow of the late Edward M. Harris. I own the property on 212 Northwest 12th Avenue, Boynton Beach, Florida, 33435. I pay the real estate taxes on this property, and my son, Edward M. Harris II, presently lives in the property. It has come to my attention that someone may be using this address to file to run for the District 2 Commission seat in Boynton Beach, Florida. I am stated on record no one living 212 Northwest 12th Avenue is running for city commission or intends to run for city commission. 
Furthermore, I have not given anyone permission to use this address fraudulently to run for office. If this address is being used to run for political office, it is false. If any candidate has used this address verbally or in writing, it is false. Sincerely, Ms. Kathy E. Harris, widow of the late Edward M. Harris. I told Mrs. Harris that I will appear tonight to read this into the records because word around town is that a lot of you sitting up there has encouraged this young man to run. In doing so, you should have did your homework. Thank you. All right, next speaker. All right, uh, Danny Farrell, 4414 Round Table Court, Boynton Beach, 33436. So first of all, thank you commissioners for letting me speak this evening. And I just wanted to go over the uh, work that the Senior Advisory Board has been doing. Uh, this year we have teamed up with the CDC uh, to provide food baskets for uh, seniors who can cook, uh, but didn't have the means to buy the food for Thanksgiving. So I'm glad to announce that we had a goal of 150 baskets that we were going to get out to the residents of the city. And we not only had that, we uh, were able to send out more and then donate the left leftovers to the food at Bien Bienvenitos, I think that's how you say it, uh, which they used then to do 200 meals on their own. So we did a very good job, very pleased. We're gonna be doing it again uh, this year. So very good. Uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was in regards to housing in the city. Uh, first of all, uh, police, fire, teachers, first responders, all that, uh, are not the most highly paid individuals, but they are very hard workers. They deserve to have proper housing that they can go to. Uh, I know Palm Beach County has been working on this issue called workforce housing, and which is very great. But the one issue with it is, is you have to meet the, med the in median income of at least $54,000 before you're eligible to be able to use workforce housing. All right. Uh, fire department starting employees make about 50,000. So unless they have somebody living with them, they are not even eligible to use the workforce housing uh, that's done by the Palm Beach County. So I would really like the commission to work with Palm Beach County, uh, the new mayor Weiss, who's heading this, uh, to see about getting some proper workforce housing in the city of Boynton Beach, which we don't have as of yet. Uh, and it needs to be aimed more towards the lower end of the pay, not the higher end. And that's the issue right now. The properties that are out there are more geared towards the moderate levels, which means people who make 70, uh, make at least 100% of the median family income or more, and it should be less. We need to provide housing for those who make less, not more. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, it's Susan Oyer, Boynton Beach. So I have three things to talk about now. So, and I was starting out with only one. So first off, I'll start with a nice, happy, cheery one. Um, Sister Cities is running a program called Home is Where the Art Is, and we are taking art donations or consignments to sell at the Kinetic Art event that's coming up at the end of the month. Um, if you want more information, you can go to our website, which is boyntonsistercities.org. Um, and fill out the form, send a picture in. Um, maybe you wanna clear some space on your walls so you can make room for all the new art you wanna buy. Um, there's probably at least a hundred pieces coming up. They'll be all prices from like a dollar, five dollars on up. Second thing I wanna talk about is the affordable housing issue, issue he just mentioned. And, and I will say, yes, I'm a realtor, but um, maybe we should be building condos and townhomes, not apartments and that would allow people to go in on the property ladder. And you could start by, um, since we're so grossly overwhelmed with apartments in this city, maybe you should look at taking all those apartments that were built to go condo at some point and reminding the developers they were supposed to do that. And then that would free up an awful lot of housing. 
So maybe you want to look at it that way, that there's plenty of affordable housing if you would just build what we actually need, not what some developer pays you to approve, which, you know, comes up in P&D regularly. My last thing, since I'm heading on that downward slope of, um, you know, irritation at the moment, is um, I want to agree with the prior speakers. Um, if you're going to have candidates running for office, they need to follow the rules. They need to live in the district where they say they live. They need to be able to prove they live where they say they live. And there's enough, you know, accusations flying around this city on a regular basis about that already. So let's not add another potential city commissioner to that problem. And you're either eligible or, or you're not. And this person is, I, I have no issues with this person. I like this person. I talk to this person. I'm friendly with this person. I think this is a wonderful person. This person should not be allowed to run for office. This person is just flat out not eligible and you either are or you're not. And it, it's obviously true. We've been hearing the stories for months that this person's not eligible and it's been proven. And so it's something you all need to look at and the rules are the rules. And this is the simple, easiest one to follow. This is not the hard rule. This is not the gray area rule. This is a black and white cut, right, wrong, up, down kind of rule. And let's just make it happen. Um, that person should not be eligible. Thank you for your time and happy new year, everyone. And I'll end on the happy note of again, um, boyntonsistercities.org. So you can donate your art or consign your art and help both Boynton Sister Cities and your fellow neighbors who wanna buy some art at an affordable price. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, begin when you're ready. Good evening, Bryce Graham, second vice president, National National Network, Central Florida chapter. Happy New Year to you all. Uh, in remembrance of Dr. King, uh, he said in one of his speeches that uh, he's decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden. And so I have been coming to the city of Boynton Beach for the better part of a year, starting in the fight uh, for justice, equality, uh, and championing for 13-year-old Stanley Dell Davis III. And on that day, a year ago to date, uh, Bishop Bernard Wright was uh, hit by a driver uh, that kept on going. So tonight I've come to uh, give uh, prompts where prompts are due. That is to your police department who has been entirely uh, working on this uh, investigation and doing their part uh, to catch that driver. Also want to note here tonight as it has been so eloquently laid out uh, by Mr. Harris and uh, by Mr. Mack and Mr. David and the, the current speaker that this spoke, that you should not have somebody in this city who is filing uh, to run for office with documents that are not proven. And we all know the consequences behind that. And so I am urging you all to look into that incident and to allow the clerk to decertify him uh, from being on the ballot unless there will be further uh, precautions and measures that the city of Boynton Beach and its residents will have to take uh, to get him off of the ballot. I will help in those efforts if need be. And so I just want to wish you all a happy new year and let's keep striving to make Boynton Beach a better place to work live and play. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. John Dames, Post Office Box 713, uh, Boynton Beach, Florida. Uh, I, I want to speak uh, briefly, and I know in the past, you know, we've had run-ins with uh, this diocese, but I'm not here to bash this diocese. What I'm here is, I actually want to uh, give um, honor to the diocese or Mr. Duggan and Chief Julio for allowing Bill Tomei to be the director of the Boynton Beach Pile. I had an opportunity to work with Bill for over 20 years. He saved a lot of kids' life from going to prison. 
He went in his own pocket and bought kids shoes that their parents can't afford. So the Bible says, Reverend, hey, give an honor where honor is due. So I'm here to get his diocese honor for making that decision because I know that program is going to be a top-notch program. I work with Bill, and he does things from the heart. And so, Reverend Hay, you know the Bible say, right, that if you just give the kids a cup of water, there's a reward. So when I told Bill, right, what you do and what you have done over the years, that's a ministry. And so I want to thank this diocese once again. I want to thank Mr. Duggan, Chief Giuliani, for allowing Bill to be the director of the Boyne Beach Pal. It was an outstanding move. He's going to he's gonna help a lot of those kids in that district. He's going to have a lot of programs. He's going to do things to keep them uh, busy, keep them off the streets. The Bible says an item mind is the devil's workshop. And so before I take my seat, uh, I just want to uh, talk briefly about my experience. Uh, about 22 years ago, working and traveling with Bill, we traveled all over. And he established that Boynton Beach Pay Our Program. And when I, we coached in that program, right, we played Jacksonville Pay Our right, basketball team, our 10-year-old team right here from Boynton. Jacksonville Pal hadn't lost a game to any team in the state of Florida in 10 years. In 10 years, no team had beat them. Bill was arguing before we even played. He was arguing with the Jacksonville fans. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy, Bill. And uh, we actually ended up beating them. We were the first team to beat the Jacksonville Pal in 10 years. And Bill told him we was going to beat him. And so I'll never forget that. It was 23 years ago. So I know what he's done. I know his capabilities. I know his heart. He's taken a lot of time away from his own family to help kids in our family, in our community. And so I want to thank y'all once again. And um, I look forward to working with this diocese, working with the community. That's what it's all about. I know y'all take a lot of flack from our district, a lot from the community, but the Bible says once again, giving honor where honor is due. So I want to give y'all y'all honor. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll make sure to share those sentiments with Mr. Bill. All right, next speaker. Good uh, evening. I want to premise this with the separation of church and state comes from Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's quote in relation to Amendment 1 in the Constitution. Constitu Cons Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Amendment 1 is really re referencing the law of equity and all of the Bill of Rights are that is where our changes can come from in crossing judicial lines. Law of equity is a law of fairness. Think on that when I present my next statement to you. Mayor, council, members, and concerned citizens, many find your attitudes unjust to openly violate the law. Your oath of office is a judicial fact that you know the law of the land. Therefore, any violation of the Constitution as supreme law of the land is intentional and therefore can be charged with a crime. Fact, your authority is limited by the Constitution of the United States for America by the enclave clause, clause. Ordering things done outside of jurisdictional lines is criminal and under the federal law of equity. The LGBTQT, which stands for lesbian, bisexual, gay, queer, transgender, puts extreme importance and pursues the interests of their beliefs that is a defined lifestyle which makes in its definition of a religion, as per the dictionary and God's word. The definition of religion, and I quote to you from the Oxford language world interpretation, and I quote, a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes as supreme importance. In Romans 1.25 of the word of God, it reads, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is blessed forever, which makes this a religion. My Christian beliefs are of supreme importance counter to the LBGTQ lifestyle, and therefore it shows extreme importance to that group which makes it a religion. The city council and mayor has chosen to choose one religion over another and outside their geographical boundaries. That should be under the authority of the people, trial by jury. 
It is against the Civil Rights Act of 1964 discrimination of religion. It has been well established that the government money cannot be used to display Jesus in a manger because it is of a devout interest of many residents and considered a religion. Disallowing the state to support with city finances and displays on government property. The city council and the mayor have chosen one religion over another in this display, violating their legislative law restrictions of supporting religions. After in violation of geographical constitution, I'd all like right. to finish this. I do want to leave a little end all. I want to be fair to everyone, Ms. Falco. So if you want to just wrap it up or give it so. to the next person, uh, one way or another, just quickly wrap it up or give it to the next okay, person. Okay, so I'm asking you have 30 days to please remove that off the off of the um, roadway, which oh. is city property, which was not permitted. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Next speaker. Please state your name for the record. Cindy Falgo de Corrado. All right, next speaker. I'm here to protest not approved by residents use of city funds to celebrate sexual, sexual content on public properties. I'm straight. I'm not asking you to paint female genitalia or male genitalia to celebrate me being straight. Why do we have to celebrate anyone's sexual preference? This flag on the road stands for sex between male and another male and sex between female and another female. It's their right, just, just like it's my right to do in my bedroom what I want. But why are we all in the city forced to celebrate it? We all see where this child grooming, because that's what it is, it's child grooming, is leading to legalization of pedophilia. Long-term plan of people who worship Satan and who wish to destroy this country from bottom up. You painted perverted symbol on the city property and installed three 666 benches in front of city hall that is very well known sign of occultism. Who are the satanists on this city commission that approved the three six benches and the perverted flag on the, on the street? I would like to know. I walk that street very often to go get an ice cream. When I come back, I have to make sure I ate that ice cream before I approach that flag and I walk over it. Because every time I walk over that flag, what I see is someone's poopy penis, because that's what this flag stands for. It stands for the sex between one female and another female, and stands for the sex between one male and another male. Why do I have to be exposed to celebrate it? I'm not asking you to celebrate my sexual preferences. Why do I have to see poopy penises almost every day? Celebrate it in the privacy of your own home. Do what you want to do. But that flag stands for poopy penis that goes inside another male's butt. It has no room on a city properties. I yield. Next speaker, and we do have two podiums, so we will go back and forth. Who would you like to hear? Uh, either one, they both work. Just make sure the light is green. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yep. I'm totally taken back. I haven't been at a commission meeting for quite a while. And you may know or you may not know, I had the privilege and the honor of being a city commissioner in Boynton Beach. I listen to the news every day. I'm a political junkie. People who know me know my passion and desire is history, American history. What I just heard makes me cry within myself. The idea that what's going on in this country is such hate and does such discrimination against one another is disgusting. All people are created equal and I respect everybody's wishes and desires as long as no one hurts anybody else. I personally am of the Jewish persuasion I'm sexually, uh, I guess a slang term is straight. And for people to come up and criticize you people who represent all the people, I find disgusting. 
and I want you to stay the way you are, believe in people, believe in the love of people, and this city needs to move forward. I'm sorry that you had to listen to this tonight. Please you state your name for the record. Can you please state your name for the record? David, Mr. Merker. I'm sorry. Name for the record, please. Uh, David Merker. All right, thank you. Moving on to the next speaker. Terry Woodworth, I just came up to represent Inca this evening. Uh, two things, that's all. Uh, one is I'd like to thank all of you guys that came to the Inca holiday party, annual fundraiser, a uh, lot of feedback from the citizens, how cool it was to actually associate and exchange ideas and views and stuff. And a few calls from uh, sponsors who said, why didn't you ask us for donations? And I'm like, well, next year we'll see you. So thank you all for doing that. That was nice as see faces and talk to people that you read about. The other thing is, is post uh, that holiday meeting, the city manager reached out to us for a follow-up meeting with several of the residents who were, well, maybe were a little vocal. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, he, he reached out. We had a very productive uh, three three Inca leaders with him uh, and on his initiative, which I thought was pretty cool. So it was nice to see that. I think something's going to come of that. I see there's still emails even up today. So just thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Again, there are two podiums. Just approach one whenever you're ready and state your name for the record. And uh, if you are in the chambers and you'd like to speak, now would be the time to make that known by forming a line. Otherwise, after the speaker, we'll go to the online speaker. Sorry, please begin when you're ready. Okay, my name is Vinnie Marino, and I would like to say that this is discrimination to have this LGBT sign, especially right near a school. And I wanna also share that as per chapter 718, section 113, dash 2017 of Florida statutes that a veteran or American has sacrificed or is proud to be an American has to have a removable flag and can only display it on a specific holiday. It cannot be more than four and a half feet by six feet that represents the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, or Coast Guard. Um, everyone has a right to their beliefs not everyone has a right to force their beliefs on everyone. If I come here and I try to force any one of you to believe something, I'm wrong. That is, the, that is what that flag represents, and it is a disgrace to have it near a school because children need to learn, get knowledge, grow up, and make their own decisions. If we're pushing things and leading children on, it is our fault, our responsibility as adults, we need to take the blame for that. We've seen a lot of damage from all of the things that are being flaunted in our children's faces. So everyone here, it doesn't matter what adults feel and think, we can all have, I'm not the thought police, but we need to protect our children and we need to do a much better job of it. So why can't we can't have a stable in a manger celebrate Christmas. We can't have Jesus Christ, but we can have LGBTQ+. I think we really need to rethink everything, okay? And we expect to see the movement within 30 days or we're going to move it forward. We're not here to argue this. We're just here to state the facts. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Last call for in-person. I see one more person, then we'll go online. Testing. Um, um, my passport says Ernest George Mignoli, 710 Northeast 7th Street, Condo 407, Boynton Beach, Florida. It's my passport. My Florida driver's license says Ernest George Mignoli, 710 Northeast 7th Street, Condo 407, Boynton Beach, Florida. It's got all my personal information and it's got the state and federal seal on it. You know what that means, right? And here's my birth certificate, all right? So my phone number is 561-788-3888, and my email is ernmignoli at gmail.com. And the reason I say that out loud and on television and cable is because I want everybody to keep calling me that all of us are working together as concerned citizens to help better this city. And it seems like the city from my two years experience, has never been more divided than it is now. 
So in an effort to try and bring it together, I hope that people uh, contact me because we're not allowed to uh, work through the city. I mean, nobody returns emails, nobody returns phone calls, nobody does anything up here. It's hard to believe that I'm a taxpayer. I'm paying all your salaries and you don't return my emails, you don't return my voicemails, you don't return my calls. I mean, how, how, where are we? I don't get it. And you know, the other thing I like to say, th there aren't too many people in this town who know more about investigations than what's going on in this city. I don't think there's too many people who have as many insights, facts, witnesses, victims as I do. And I'm not allowed to comment on anything, really. You know, I witnessed these deaths take place right in front of me. And all of a sudden you all say, sorry, any other press can get information, but not Mr. McNally. But yet I'm able to go before the United States of America court in federal court as a credential press person, but I'm not allowed to come before, right? And and why? Because, because in my opinion, this commission has lost touch with concerned citizens and what's best for this city. And I have so much information, facts and documents that I hope somebody listening, maybe a lawyer or somebody can bring us all together so that we can turn this around instead of coming here in what looks like a police state that scares the heck out of all of us. What kind of city meeting is going to have 10, 15 officers with guns and tasers? You know what this is doing to us? It puts us in a state of absolute fear. And what's funny is you guys sit on the dais and you think it's funny. It's not very funny. Oh, I have one second left. Can I get an extra 10 minutes? Can I get an extra 10 minutes? All right, your time has expired. I see no other in-person public comment speaker. So we're gonna go online. Mr. Mani, Mayor, do you have anybody online with their digital hands raised? We have one hand raised. That's Vanessa Belmonte. Vanessa, you've been unmuted, but you're self-muted. Thank you. All right, Ms. Belmonte, I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining, because I know you can't see the timer. Um, and please state your name to the record. Begin when you're ready. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Belmonte. My address is 100 Northeast 6th Street, Boynton Beach, 33435. Um, I am here in regards to the pedestrian crossing on East Ocean Boulevard and 6th Street that's being proposed this evening and hopefully approved. Um, I brought this matter up to Commissioner Turkin because I live in Marina Village and I often myself and other residents and visitors are dangerously crossing Ocean Avenue at 6th Street to get to the plaza and back to the marina and vice versa. So I think it's really important that we prioritize the safety of our residents, the safety of our visitors, and especially the children, and of course the dogs. <laughs> it's really hard to cross that street, people coming over the bridge and racing from federal, and take it from me, it's not ideal situation. And sometimes it takes like a good five minutes to be able to cross because there's so many cars. So I think it'd be great if we can even get, I know that the new building that's unfortunately an apartment complex that the two Georges owner um, proposed and is now confirmed and now it's mid construction. It would be great if we got them involved and maybe they can fund it. And maybe we don't take money from the city to fund it because they're the ones who wanna make that connection to to Georges, Banana Boat, the Plaza and their new apartment complex. So it'd be great to get them involved and just historically incorporate that kind of initiative in the future. If, if people wanna build here, if condos and developers wanna decide to build then they should have to fund some sort of pedestrian um, support along that way so anyway thank you so much for your time and i really hope that we can pass this crosswalk to improve the safety and um, connectivity of our city thank you thank you money just confirming there are no other hands raised mr mayor vanessa was the only one who had her hand raised during the time that you've called for people to speak all right Thank you, everybody. Public comments are now closed. We're now gonna move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is administrative, appoint eligible members of the community to serve in vacant positions on city advisory boards. So let's open up that list. Mayor? Yes, Commissioner Hay. Uh, if I may, uh, 
I know this is not a Q and A, but I would, if you would uh, allow me to uh, direct the uh, city clerk just to verify one more time the addresses and bring us a report back at the next meeting. And that's what we will go with. Okay, uh, just take another look because this has been an ongoing and we have um, other things to do. Commissioner Hay, I'm, I can see that council has their hands raised. Yeah, so I'm gonna to turn to council. Does, does, um, when you're talking about qualifications for elections, the clerk's responsibilities is to accept the forms and look and see if they're facially acceptable. The clerk doesn't do any investigations. Okay, the clerk. Who the does clerk, the verification of the addresses? If the, the, the she can explain what she does, but when she gets the applications, if someone puts under oath, "This is where I live," "This is I'm qualified," provides the address, the information, and everything um, appears on his face to be sufficient, she accepts that and qualifies the candidate. There is a way for folks to challenge that. Um, you know, the clerk is not. A judge, the clerk does not investigate, the clerk doesn't take sworn testimony, the clerk doesn't verify documentation, the clerk accepts the package and has that responsibility that once it's on its face to qualify the candidate, there is um, uh, ability to challenge that um, in another forum where an appropriate person can weigh the evidence and consider the facts and circumstances and make a decision whether someone should remain on the ballot or not but the clerk is not under your charter, does not investigate um, and does not uh, do any independent verification if it's, if it's acceptable, if it's, if it's on its face complete and meets the, quali meets the requirements of your charter. Commissioner, well, uh, go ahead, Commissioner. If I may, uh, Attorney, uh, so if I have a question asked to me as to verification of addresses, should I direct them to uh, the supervisor of election office, how should I answer uh, when that question comes up? Because it has come up to me several times and I just sort of uh, ignore it, but uh, I want the proper uh, procedure for that. The clerk accepted the paperwork with the address that was in the qualification papers. I, I, I get that. And if, if there's a question of whether that's accurate or not, folks have done their review, it appears from the research and whatnot. Um, and they can seek relief to see whether it's appropriate for that person to be on the ballot or not. I don't want to give legal advice, but there is a forum where the veracity of what is provided to the clerk can be determined. The clerk is not that person. Okay, so wanna... <laughs> so I, I, I don't want to prolong this, mm -hmm. but I just want an answer so that I can respond when when I'm given that question, when I'm asked that question, uh, I guess there is no, I, I understand about our city clerk. I got that, okay? But where do I direct them to? Is there an answer for that? If they want to challenge the, yes. the authenticity of it? Yes. Courthouse. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, I see that uh, Vice Mayor Cruz has her hand up. Vice Mayor. My understanding is that the Supervisor of Elections Office works together with the city clerk and facilitates elections for the city. Is that a relevant resource that we can utilize to maybe investigate further? Maybe the city clerk can email the Supervisor of Elections Office and make them aware of the situation of the paperwork that's been provided um, tonight as public record well the supervisor the clerk acts as our supervisor for qualifying candidates and so they'll, they'll have information perhaps voter registration information etc that could be evidence to show that whatever the person provided to the clerk is not accurate or is in, inaccurate or whatnot but again the, the the clerk isn't doesn't do an investigation of information they're not she, she would not be able to weigh and say the, the information from the supervisor of elections is better than the information that was provided or from a different source like a driver's license or something like that. City manager, did you want to weigh in? It looks like you were about to. Yeah, before we go forward, I, don't, I think what we're lacking here is a store precedence as far as the mm -hmm. city goes to where we don't really have an example to go off of where this has happened before. So before we jump to conclusions and we try to 
go forward with a process it doesn't seem like we're none of us are sure about i think the prudent decision would be to kind of take our time this week i'll get staff i'll uh work with legal we'll come up with a plan to verify the veracity of the complaint or the um, information that we got tonight we have the information that was provided by i want to say david katz and uh mac mccray and we'll go over that we'll come up with a plan of action uh we'll actually communicate with each individual commissioner as far as like what that plan of action is and we'll move forward just so we're making sure we're operating within the parameters of the law we're not violating mr joseman's rights we're not violating um any sort of uh, election laws or anything like that. So I think the it's always best to try to take our time. All right, Commissioner Turkin. Um, nope, city manager, I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't remember what paperwork I had to file, but I, you know, I think if uh, obviously the qualification paperwork to represent, you know, your qualification as far as living in the city, I don't remember submitting a utility bill. Is that is that required? I didn't think so. Um, that might be an easy fix as we move forward. Um, also, this is a question for legal. If we wanted to change the requirement that the charter states one year, let's say to five years as an example, that would need to be on a ballot for referendum. Or can you give me some clarity on that? Yeah, anytime you amend the charter, it would require a referendum. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Kelly, do you have any questions or comments? I do not, thank you. All right, Commissioner Hay, uh, was that the conclusion of your comments? Yes. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Again, we are under administrative, appointing eligible members of the community to serve in vacant positions on city advisory board and the list is as follows. We have an opening in the Art Advisory Board, no applicants. Building Board of Adjustments and Appeal, we have an opening there. Education and Youth Advisory Board, we have several openings. Uh, the first applicant is Laura Fasolo for the Employees Pension Plan Board. Commissioner Turkin, this is your nomination for a regular uh, pension plan board seat, which is a three-year term. Would you like to make a nomination? Yep, I'd like to nominate Laura. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, all those in favor of appointing Laura Fasolo to the Employees Pension Plan Board, say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes uh, unanimously with uh, Vice Mayor Cruz in absence. Uh, Historic Resources Preservation Board, we have applicant Victor Norfus and Commissioner Kelly, this is your appointment for an alternate seat for a duration of one year. Would you like to make an appointment? Yes, I would like to appoint Victor Norfus to that seat. All right, we have a second. second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to the library board, we have openings, no applicant, planning and development board, no applicants. Uh, Police officers retirement trust fund. I'd like to nominate Russell Fain for the city resident position on the trust fund board for a period of four years may I have a second second all right all those in favor say aye. aye aye all those opposed say no the ayes have it motion passes unanimously we have no applicants for the recreation and parks board nor the senior advisory board we do have positions available in both of those <clears throat> advisory boards commissioner turkin yeah i i um just got a message from a constituent about the planning and development board they would like to apply would they do we do they have to apply first before I would make a nomination? Okay. Have them reach out to the city clerk and okay. she'll give them the appropriate forms. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. That concludes administrative. We're now moving on to consent agenda. Are there any items that my colleagues would like to pull from consent agenda? Let's begin with uh, Commissioner Kelly. Yes. I would like to pull uh, 6C, 6D and 6H. 6H. All right, so I heard 6C, D, and H. Those items have now been pulled. Uh, Commissioner Turkin? Um, can you come back to me, Mayor? Yes, absolutely, Commissioner Hay. The one I wanted to pull was H, and that's already been pulled. All right, and um, 
All right, so just those three items so far. We have a motion to approve the remainder of consent agenda. So move. We have a motion from Commissioner Hay. May have a second. To okay. prove, we have a second from Commissioner Kelly. I'm sorry. No, I'm going to pause right we're, there. Were there we're anything good, else, we're Commissioner? Good we're good, good to go. go. I mean, All right. Six A, but uh, we we heard about it, so let's go ahead and get that done. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The remainder of cons consent agenda has now been approved. Let's begin with item six A, proposed resolution R23-003. Approve and authorize the mayor to sign a FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant application to the Florida Division of Emergency Management for the heart of Boynton infrastructure retrofit and authorize the execution by appropriate city officials of all documents associated with the grant application. And I see uh, Dr. Calcutt is approaching uh, the podium. Good evening and, and welcome. Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, um, I don't know if you have questions on this. I have a brief presentation. Uh, this grant was for FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant. We have since heard from FEMA that they may not be able to fund this grant, but I would, I would like to go through the presentation if you so allow me. We are looking at other funding sources and looking at other ways to um, do some of the work, whether it's in phases and so on and so forth, because we do uh, really believe that this work needs to be done and that's uh, needed for that community. All right, let's hear that presentation. Yeah. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Kalkada if we could keep it to 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just talking about what the grant, FEMA grant was. It's a 2.13, billion dollar grant and that was going to have 50 million per sub application and we had applied for a 42 million dollar grant in there. The priorities for uh, BRIC are basically incentivizing some of the natural hazard risk reduction activities that mitigate risk to public infrastructure and disadvantaged communities, incorporate nature-based solutions, enhance climate resilience and adaptation, increase funding for adoption, and enforcement of latest building codes and encourage hazard mitigation projects that meet multiple program priorities. Um, next slide, please. This is just giving you the map of uh, the area, what we're calling Heart of Boynton. So on the north side, you have the C-16 Canal. On the uh, south side, it's West Boynton um, Beach Boulevard. And on the east side, it's North Federal Highway. On the west side, it's uh, Northwest 3rd Street. So that's the area we're looking at. Next slide, please. The purpose of this project was to mitigate the following risks, looking at flooding in this area. Um, some of the road conditions are unsafe, and we also have aging water and sewer infrastructure that we wanted to replace or line. Next slide, please. We were going to be working on proposing to mitigate against severe storms, and this was going to be a phased approach with the first phase being just doing more additional studies and design, and that would have defined what exactly needed to be done. And the second phase would be construction and closeout. And we're going to continue working in similar kind of fashion for other uh, resources. Next slide, please. The next two slides are just talking, showing you what infrastructure needs were there. There are some uh, water mains that need to be replaced, uh, some water main, uh, some sanitary sewer that needs to be lined or replaced. Next slide, please. Storm water needs as well as roadway needs. Um, so we've identified some of these. We were also going to do more study in the area so we could define some of the things that we may not be aware of a little bit better um, so the project could be uh, better defined but there are certain things that we already know what we need to do there. Next slide, please. The total budget project cost was 42 million and uh, it required a 30% local match, which uh, from the city, the utilities was going to be uh, putting in 12.6 million. We were still going to look for trying to get either SRF loans or other ways to uh, match that too. So wherever we can match the funds we are trying, Certain things we are not allowed to, it's 
sort of like double dipping. If it's a federal grant, you may not be allowed to get more. But we are looking, we are working with a consultant to look at how can we stretch our dollars and the farthest we can. Next slide, please. The phase one, as I defined, described, is going to be some pre-design activities, um, looking at uh, environmental historic preservation compliance review, uh, topography, elevations, right away, existing utilities, um, looking at that, those surveys, looking at some nature-based solutions. And then in the engineering design, we were going to be designing, looking at uh, benefit cost analysis. We had to do a benefit cost analysis for application, but this would have been more thorough. Uh, we're going to continue doing some of this and moving in uh, this direction. Permitting and final design, and then value engineering and resilience uh, evaluation. Uh, there would be public outreach as well as bid administration and contractor selection in the first phase. Next slide, please. The second phase uh, involved pre-construction activities uh, with utility coordination, mobilization, uh, MOT and temporary erosion sediment control, and then the construction phase looking at water retrofit, um, sewer replacement, lift station installation, any drainage structures uh, that needed to be uh, redone, roadway restoration and close out of the project. And on both phases, you can see the um, division of how the money was going to be. The construction phase obviously has the most money. The next slide, please. This is just uh, describing some of the deadlines and estimated dates and status of where we were. So as you can see, the December 30th was the estimated time for when they were going to make a decision. With the holidays, it really was a cramped um, timeline for us. And so we were sending st uh, stuff to FEMA, working with them. And we just heard uh, just a couple of days back uh, that they may not be funding. We were, reached out to them again today and asked them to review it again, give us some more feedback. So they're willing to work with us, but they've given us some other options of some maybe AGMP grants or some other CDBG grants. So we are going to be working on those and looking for those. And that's the end of my presentation and I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for that presentation. Commissioner Kelly, this was your item. Do you have any questions? No, I I brought this up because uh, anytime we're getting a large amount of money from uh, a grant, it's always good to hear what's going on. And, and that's an area that has needed uh, assistance and needed renovation for a long time so i was excited to see it come up i'm disappointed that you know fema is saying that they're not going to give us the money but i thank you for pivoting and trying to figure out how we can make this work because it is an important area that needs uh it needs updating and it needs upgrading so uh thank you i think these presentations are always helpful to see what's what's needed in the city so Excellent. Anything else from my colleagues on this item? Commissioner Hay? Yes. Um, I, I'm the northwest corner of, well, just as you go over Gateway, to the north of that is Northwest First Court. Is that area included in your pre design? Um, I'll have to go back and check. Okay. But I, I, I want to make sure that it, that it is, and I'm okay. just curious as to what the approach might be since you've already made a, a pre-design, you might have an idea that you could share with us, but I will accept, uh, just go back, take a look and, and I'll get with you or you can share it with us uh, when you get a, an answer. Absolutely, and we are looking at, we are going to be doing phased approach throughout the city to look at what the needs are so we can define them clearly and come up with how we're going to fund and how long it's going to take us to do some of the work that's needed. So I'll look at that specifically, that area that you've asked and come back to the commission. I appreciate it. To you. Thank Absolutely. you. That's it. Thank you, Commissioner Hay. Anything else from my colleagues? Going once, going twice. Uh, since there's no further discussion, may I have a motion to approve resolution R23-003? So move. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Turkin, a second from Commissioner Hay. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. The next polled item was 6D, proposed resolution number R23-004, authorizes the city manager to sign all documents associated with the acceptance and grant agreement for the Victims of Crime Act grant subject to the approval of the city attorney. Who would like to take this item? City manager? Yeah, essentially what would, this is is a um, Victims of Crimes Act grant. And right now we currently have one victim advocate at the um, police department. Basically what the, anytime there's a critical incident, if a domestic violence victim needs assistance, those individuals are specially trained to provide that assistance if a child is in need of care, any sort of special victims, uh, victims of a crime, um, any sort of heinous activities towards kids, anything like that, that victim advocate can help assist that family in getting the resources that they need so this is uh, definitely a big win. I want to give a uh, definitely a big thank you to uh, Jacqueline Smith, who's the grant manager over at the uh, Boynton Beach Police Department. She helped put this together. I want to say the uh, funding amount was a little bit over $78,000. So that's going to give us a full-time victim advocates position, which is uh, I'm just going to be uh, free of charge to the uh, to the city. 74,000. My apologies. I just uh, saw the number on the um, screen, but it's uh, definitely a Definitely a good grab. So the kudos to her and uh, Chief to Julia. So. Thank you, City Manager. Questions and comments from my colleagues on this resolution. Commissioner Turkin. Uh, how will um, that victim advocate be chosen? It's going to be through a hiring process. Okay. Same, so same, same, okay. same exact hiring process we have for every other employee. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. It's just the funding is going to be different. Perfect. Thank you, Commissioner. Excellent question. Anything else from my colleagues? Seeing none, we have a motion to approve proposed resolution number R23-004. So moved. We have a motion from Commissioner Kelly. And <laughs> you guys said it so quickly. <laughs> Let's just go with second with uh, Commissioner A. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. The last polled item was 6H, proposed resolution number R23-006, adopt the 2022 Affordable Housing Advisory Committee Housing Incentive Review Report. All right. Mayor, Commissioner, RJ Ramirez, uh, Community Improvement Manager, and I have a very small presentation. If you like me, I can pull it up. All right, so uh, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee is a requirement for local governments that receive CHIP funds, uh, State Housing Initiative Partnership Program. So each year, these uh, Affordable Housing Advisory Committee is uh, required by a Florida statute, or the CHIP statute, to uh, review 11 incentives that are set by this statute. Um, <clears throat> Let me go ahead and uh, get my slide here. Can I read there? Got it right here. So this uh, this report is uh, sent to the uh, city commission and also to the uh, Florida Finance uh, uh, Corporation and the Florida Housing uh, uh, Corporation. Is just once again a requirement of the grant itself. <coughs> uh, next uh, slide. Uh, Please. So the incentives, the incentives itself, I can read them to you, but they're in the report. Uh, and they are, uh, number one, the processing of approval or development orders or permits for affordable housing project uh, is, is expedited to a degree um, uh, uh, than other projects. Um, uh, that's one of them. And that, uh, that uh, incentive is one of the ones that is a required of the grant. Uh, the second one is all allowable fees waivers provided for the development of construction of affordable housing. Number three is the allowance of flexible intensity for affordable housing. The reservation of infrastructure capacity for housing for very low income person, uh, moderate income person, uh, affordable house, housing, affordable associated, uh, sorry, affordable accessory residential units, number five. Number six, uh, the reduction of parking set by requirement for affordable housing. Number seven, the allowance of flex, uh, flexible local law configuration, including zero lot line configuration for affordable housing. Number eight, the modification of street requirement for affordable housing. 
number nine, the establishment of a process by which local government consider before adopting policy, procedure, ordinance, regulation, or plan provision that increases the cost of rural housing. Number 10, the preparation of a printing inventory or locally owned public lands suitable for affordable housing. And number 11, the support of development near the protection hubs and mayor employment center and mid use developments. Uh, next slide, thank you. So uh, again, uh, like I mentioned, there is only two incentives that are required by this grant. Uh, one of them is the processing of approval of development orders or permits for affordable housing. A uh, project is expedited to a great degree other than uh, other projects, and that one is in place where uh, affordable housing permit get expedited. Uh, and the second one that is a requirement as well is the establishment of a process by which local government consider uh, before adoption of policy, procedure, ordinance, regulation, or plans uh, that increase the cost of affordable housing. So that's pretty much the ongoing review process or any policy that goes uh, uh, or, or will affect uh, uh, affordable housing. So the uh, uh, review, co the uh, committee, the AHA committee reviews this incentive every year. It used to be every three years, now it's every year. And this is a requirement again for those uh, local government that receive $350,000 or more in grant. So the uh, the state has pledged that local government will receive at least going forward $350,000 and therefore now the uh, AHA committee uh, reviewed this same incentives every year. So, um, and then uh, there's some other incentives that are part of the land development regulation that are also included that the city has taken in, which is the flexible densities, parking and setback requirements and support of development near transportation subs. So the AHA committee for this uh, uh, 2022 uh, report uh, is uh, recommending uh, one of the incentives, uh, the identification of impact fee requirements including reduction or waiver of fees and alternative methods of payment for affordable housing. So the city has a current, a current, current process, which is the uh, uh, fee exception of uh, our in public places for the percentage of the project dedicated to affordable housing. And this for our project that are 250,000 uh, uh, or more construction value. So there is uh, this in place or now. So the AHA is looking at to get a redu fee reduction on, uh, on permit, affordable housing permits. So uh, what the staff is commenting on it and, and, and making a suggestion on it as part of the CHIP grant, uh, give um, uh, the city's impact theory, uh, do, uh, which had to do with the cottage, uh, parks, water and sewer, it's about $4,100 that could come from the cheap grant uh, with the condition that the, this grant comes with a lot of strings attached, so to speak, a lot of set asides. And uh, this one, one of them is being that the March maximum purchase price of a property, one is built and sell to a, 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 a user, has to be 382194 or less. So in order for us to be able to give an incentive and try to give a credit to the developer at closing, uh, it has to be for a property that when it's sold, has to be for uh, by you know, 382,194 $382, or less. And also that the, the buyer participate in the CHIP program. So the CHIP program gives uh, buyers uh, incentives where we pay them the uh, closing costs, down payment assistance, some gap financing and everything. In addition, that we will also increase this amount to it. Uh, also, the development department, after talking with staff and development department, they say that they also could give uh, two expedited permit reviews that cost around, it's a credit about $1,000 that also they can give to those um, nonprofit organizations uh, for the uh, single family affordable housing. And this is just to increase and to uh, incentivize, so to speak, uh, the development of affordable housing or attainable housing, what they call it now. So, and I, and I uh, if you guys, uh, if you have any questions, I will uh, I'll be able to happily answer any question you might have at this point. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, you pulled this item, so I'll begin with you. Thank you, yes. Um, the reason I pulled this item is because I sit um, with Commissioner Hay on this uh, committee, and one of the concerns that came up was that this report had been previously submitted and it was denied and that they it was being resubmitted as it was. I wanna, I, 
there are staff recommendations in here that I wanted to make sure that they were on the record and read for the record for the purpose of disclosure, um, that there's uh, one of the things that the committee was, uh, it was important to the committee was um, permitting fee reductions or waivers. And um, as we know by reading staff comments, that's not something that we, that the city is allowed to do. So m the reason for my pulling this item was more of a, uh, kind of to get it on the record as to why there's certain things that can't be done. Um, but but I'm very happy to hear that city staff has recommendations on some creative ways that we can offer incentives um, to uh, the affordable housing, uh, you know, to the developers, the small developers, our local nonprofits, uh, to give them some uh, some help in, you know, starting up these uh, these affordable housing. So that was kind of the reason for my, I don't necessarily have any direct questions. I just wanted to bring attention to the, the staff comments and, and make it, you know, clear as to where the recommendations were, what the rec recommendations were, and why they're not feasible. And 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 that then city staff has been creative in finding ways that, uh, we can offer some additional incentives. So I want to thank you for that, but that was the reason for my bringing it up. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Are there any other questions or comments from the dais? Vice Mayor Cruz. Hmm. How can um, a resident or home buyer participate in the city ship program and who did it reach out to in staff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a open application process at the moment. Uh, the public can either contact me and we have the applications available at the front desk and also we have it available on, online. So the public can go online and submit the application. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty self-explanatory uh, and there are some certain documents that we need to collect in order for us to be able to uh, income qualify a, an applicant and also is documentation that the grant require for us to have in files every time that the grant gets added we need to have certain documentation so uh, the uh, uh, public can call me directly and the phone number is online and also i is available once again on the front desk and also my phone number is pretty much kind of everywhere per se so those are the ways all right thank you anything else from my colleagues Seeing no further discussion, I'm sorry, Commissioner Kelly, did you want to add anything else? No, I guess my only question would be, because there are staff comments on how the report should be, we can't we can't approve it as it's as it was presented by the committee. So how do we direct staff to amend the report before being submitted? Or does it get submitted with staff comments? How does that? Exactly. So at this point, uh, that's what is is probably before commission to be discussed. Um, and these comments will be sent with the revision to the Florida Finance Corporation, so they know that these, uh, if approved by commission, that it will be added as as part of the uh, the uh, chip program. All right. Thank you. Council, did you want to weigh in on that? I looked like you were about to No, say I something. wasn't sure where the question was directed, but you got your answer. All right, thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, may I have a motion to approve resolution number R23-006? So moved. We have a motion from okay. Commissioner Kelly and a second from Commissioner Hay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. That concludes consent agenda. We're moving on to consent bids and purchases over $100,000. We only have one item on here. Is there a request to pull this item? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve 7A? So we'll move. We have a motion from Commissioner Hay, a second from, I believe that was Commissioner Kelly. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. We are now moving on to item 12A, which we have moved up. This is the settlement agreement in which time I will turn now to council, our city attorney uh, to introduce this item. Mr. Mayor, members of the city commission, uh, this is before you in a, uh, resolution 23008 to approve a settlement agreement in the case of the city of Boynton Beach uh, versus JKM BTS Capital LLC. 
Um, just a brief background, the city and JKM entered into the development agreement in uh, March of 2018 as part of the Town Square project. The project had both public and private um, components. As part of a competitive selection process, E2L was selected to facilitate the project. The public component has been completed, including City Hall, where we're in right now. JKM was selected by E2L to be the developer for the private component of the project. To facilitate the private component, the city conveyed three parcels of real property to JKM to be used for the development of a mixed-use development. The private component also required the construction of two parking garages, which were to be constructed by JKM with certain benchmarks specified in the development agreement. Um, after JKM failed to initiate development of the private component, including the parking garages, um, the city commission in November of 2020 authorized the city attorney's office to file declaratory action to resolve the matter. The complaint for declaratory relief was filed in November of 2020. It was limited in scope to relief that it sought asking the court only to construe the terms of the, develop of the development agreement and to declare the certain timeframes when JCAM was required to initiate development in parking garages. It was not a complaint seeking the court to declare JCAM had breached the terms or to seek damages. Um, the city has since been retained, uh, city retained uh, Tom Baird of Jones Foster a Law Firm to be special counsel in the litigation. Um, he's here tonight to provide more information on the specifics of the settlement agreement. Um, also, um, here is um, Catherine Rosmel. You may recall the city commission authorized the retention of Lewis Longman and Walker to uh, represent the city and assist the city in legal matters regarding Town Square. Um, this, this settlement agreement, if it's approved, would facilitate uh, the closing of this property um, and the sale of the property to a subsequent developer. Um, that subsequent developer um, is also here tonight to give a brief background on who they are and um, what they can uh, do for the city. But you are not voting on any development this evening. You're voting on the settlement agreement. And, and um, the settlement agreement, if you vote on it and approve it this evening, is contingent on a few things, including the uh, sale of the property, which in turn is contingent on uh, them getting certain approvals. But by voting on this or approving this, you are not committing to vote either way on anything, any applications. All those applications, by the way, will have to come before you through the proper course, public hearings, planning development board and city commission. So at this time, I'd like to turn over to Tom Baird to go through the settlement uh, agreement with you and answer any questions you may have on that. Thank you, council, Mr. Baird. Thank you, Mayor. Happy New Year to you and the Commission. Happy New Year. Um, <clears throat> I know we've met several times in, in private sessions to discuss this. Um, my law firm is the oldest law firm in Palm Beach County, and uh, I'm not as old as my law firm. Uh, <laughs> it, it began in 1924, but my point in bringing that to your attention is that We've been in this community for a long time. Uh, we are known uh, as a, a very good litigation firm. My own background has been in land use litigation specifically. And I've also been a city attorney for more than 30 years. Um, we were brought into this lawsuit after it began. Uh, city attorney has summarized sort of the background of, of where this has been. After we were brought into the lawsuit, one of the first things that happened was that the developer's attorneys contacted us and wanted to discuss some mediation or settlement of the lawsuit. Um, we began in June of 2021, formal mediation of this lawsuit. Um, the, the mediator <clears throat> spent we spent an entire day with the mediator in his offices in Fort Lauderdale. We thought we were on a path towards settling this litigation at that time, uh, but that was not to be. We had to go through a period of time where we had to engage in some discovery, taking depositions, things of that nature. Um, but we have continued diligently with the assistance of the commission and getting the feedback from you to work towards a resolution of the lawsuit because the resolution of the lawsuit in a way that is acceptable to the commission is the most expeditious way to complete the town square project. Continuing with litigation will not complete this project. Continuing with the litigation will present the opportunity sometime 
several years in the future to begin a project either with the not likely but with the existing developer or a new developer so set the the settlement dialogue has been productive we're currently on a trial docket in february um, now we believe that if you approve this settlement agreement this evening and we are able to represent that to the court that we will be taken off of that trial docket because at least in my 30 years of experience in litigation, judges are always agreeable to removing cases from their docket because their docket is so overloaded that they won't miss one case. So what does the settlement agreement provide? These are the, these are the important features of it. Of course, it has all of the, the uh, lawyer boilerplate language in there that protects their respective clients and, and uh, are necessary for the court to consider it, but this is contingent, the settlement is contingent on JKM, John Markey's uh, development company, sale of the parcels to another developer. There is a contract that exists, we understand, between JKM and another developer, and you're gonna hear a little bit from that developer later on, but we're not talking about the project. We're just talking about what the settlement agreement is contingent upon. The city, uh, upon the closing of the property, at the closing of that sale, the city would be given $4.5 million. In addition to that, the city will be paid up to $100,000 in reimbursable allocations for its defense for the also pending litigation brought by E2L against the city and late uh, against JKM and later against the city regarding its um, what I might characterize as hurt feelings over being left out of the development dialogue with respect to the JKM property. There must be, to protect the city, an executed new development agreement. It's fair to say that it is likely the new development agreement uh, will be better than the old development agreement. And it's fair to say that it must provide and will provide for the public parking spaces that were supposed to be delivered by JKM a year ago. The, it will also provide for the continuation of the existing temporary parking. You may recall, actually, you you probably weren't commissioners. Uh, maybe maybe the mayor was, but when Markey didn't deliver on the parking garage, there still had to be parking for the public so that they could come to this very fine city hall that you have and participate. So. I, public parking lot, surface parking lot was in place. And this agreement, this new development agreement uh, would provide for the continuation of that um, until such time as the parking garages are built. Once those particular conditions are met, then there would be a joint dismissal by the parties of the lawsuit. And if it's not, if the conditions that are in paragraph two of the settlement agreement are not met, met, the city may either amend its lawsuit or file a new lawsuit. Uh, from our perspective, you're gonna have to, if, if, you, if the city winds up in that position, you're gonna have to amend your lawsuit to seek uh, more than just declaratory relief. You're gonna have to seek a breach of contract claim against JKM. And finally, of course, the city's getting a full and complete general release, uh, both of all of the current commissioners and former commissioners and other city officials. The city has no obligations to the new developer. Those obligations will only come at such time as a new development agreement is entered into with the new developer. The city's not required to approve any new development agreement or any new development plan. 
that process has to occur in public, has to go through the normal process um, that any developer would go through who is entering into a development agreement and pursuing a master plan and site plan. So for a development agreement, Florida law, specifically a statute in 163, Florida statutes provides that development agreements are required to have two public hearings. And after those public hearings, and after the commission hears from the public about what's in that new development agreement, at that time, the commission could take action to approve that new development agreement. Um, in all likelihood, as was the case previously, you would have a master plan that's attached to that new development agreement that reflects what the overall project, the new project is going to look like. Um, but even after that, the master plan and then individual site plans for whatever specific site development occurs within that master plan would come before you as it does in the normal zoning process, go through your advisory board, come to you, um, and you have the final say on whether you believe that master plan is appropriate, whether you believe those individual site plans are appropriate. Uh, the public gets their say in all of that, um, and the process unfolds just like the public process that's required by your city code and by state law. There's no uh, shortcut to this. It's got to go through the public transparent process. What one would hope, and from some of the uh, conceptual ideas that I've heard, um, is that you're probably going to get a, pro a better project. Um, once the approvals are in place, once you've heard all of the applications, you've approved every everything uh, with any conditions that you feel are appropriate, then and only then would the developer begin initi and initiate construction of the project. That would include, of course, the parking garages that were never initiated, which led to this lawsuit in the first place. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more about the um, developer. His couple of his uh, agents are here tonight, but um, I, I move in development circles, and I have heard of the reputation of this developer, and I think it's it's a uh, tremendous upgrade for you. So hopefully that will work out. Um, but most importantly, this is a magnificent public project that you and your predecessors have facilitated. This city hall, this police station, fire station, museum, you, you know, you go around Palm Beach County and they, any city would be envious to have what you have. Seriously envious. This is a, this is a wonderful facility that has been delivered for your citizens. And hopefully, uh, with some diligence, which has already gone on by your staff, your city manager, your city attorney, outside counsel, the private side of this project is going to be just as magnificent and complementary to the public side of this project. And you will realize what the city set out to realize a number of years ago. It's unfortunate that the relationship between the parties of developer and city that were codified in that original development agreement did not work out. When we were in mediation, we compared it to a bad marriage. And maybe that's what it was. But that doesn't mean you can't have a good marriage after that one. And so, this has been a long and costly process. And my suggestion would be that if you find that the settlement agreement is acceptable to you, don't duplicate it by saying no to the settlement agreement and then having us amend the complaint and go through this process. We've already been in litigation for 
two and a half years, more than almost three years. So, you know, if we have to amend a complaint and go back through the process again, you're probably looking at a similar length of time and substantial expense to go through that process. At the end of the process, if you win, then somebody may start your project if there's another developer that will, will come in for it. So I would say to you that this for the city is something that delivers to the city what you set out to or what your predecessors set out to deliver. I think through no fault of their own, um, although folks may, may want to cast fault their way, um, this didn't work out. But if I had my say in it, I would say, I would look to the developer who breached his obligations to the city in this, if you wanna cast any fault in this. So I encourage you to uh, explore any questions you have with me, uh, any comments, I'm, I'm happy to address any portion of the agreement um, and anything else you would like me to address. Thank you for that summary, Mr. Baird. Let's uh, open the floor now to questions or comments for Mr. Baird. And after him, we'll hear from uh, Catherine Rosmel. Uh, Commissioner Hay, please begin. Uh, yes, Tom. Uh, am I understanding it correctly that, let me rephrase it. Uh, at what point do we no longer have to deal with JKM? Is after we agree and sign that settlement agreement? So at, at what point do we not have to worry about them? Uh, you have signed the settlement agreement, but remember settlement is contingent upon the sale of the property. Um, so you would no longer deal with JKM upon the sale of the property. Let's say that we have a, a, a developer that we're looking at and, and the property is, uh, we're going that direction. At that point, is JKM out of the picture? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Anything else from my colleagues while well, we have Mr. Baird on the podium? Commissioner Turkin? Yeah, I just want to start off by saying <clears throat> it's an absolute disgrace that we're sitting here right now and having to deal with this and that this commission inherited this problem from the previous one. And so I want to say on the record that everyone remembers and do their research and look at those officials on who, at, for the reason of why we got here <clears throat> and also city staff. And also to see that we didn't make a complaint seeking the court to declare that JKM had breached the terms of the development agreement gives us no leverage. <clears throat> that being said, I do want to see something get done here. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is when that's going to get done and what it's going to look like, what it's going to be. So just to clarify, this settlement agreement, again, will be contingent on everything stated here below. And in that is site plan approvals, correct? Correct. Right. Okay. So I know time equities is here. And, um, you know, I just, I just want to say, you know, if this thing moves forward, you know, I, I want to make sure that, you know, we have a good relationship moving forward because this is a huge project that, the previous commission missed the ball on. I don't know, you know, I don't know time equities, don't know, you know, JKM obviously, but I want to make sure that if we do go in agreement that, you know, we are able to represent and partner with time equities to do what's best for the constituents, especially in this district, the downtown district. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that we have that, open dialogue in that it's it's not a one-sided uh, project. And so I just want to say that for the record that, you know, you guys are working with community. I know there's other developers that have come and reached out to the community. They're in the audience now and have worked with community, have gotten feedback from local businesses, you know, talked to constituents and really, 
you know, keep the community in mind when it comes to bringing a project into Boynton Beach. Um, you know, this again, this is a this is a hard pill to swallow. You know, the big ticket item for us to decide on. <clears throat> but you know, there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for this settlement agreement to be executed. And um, you know, I want to say for myself, I will go to bat for the people of this district and the people of this city to make sure that we get the right plan, you know, here in the city and in the downtown. All right, thank you, Commissioner. And let's move on to anyone else on the commission here. Any questions or comments, Commissioner Kelly? Yes, um, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Barrett. I, I, I just have one question, because one question that has always come up or that residents have asked is why um, why the city couldn't get our land back. And I just, I want to, you talked about discovery that you did through the process. Was there any discovery that would, any evidence that came out of that discovery would support the city retaining or being able to win any sort of lawsuit to retain that land? Well, the to address your question that has been asked by citizens specifically, absence proving that there was fraud in entering into this development agreement, it would be very difficult to get that land back. Um, from the discovery that was taken, and the discovery was, of course, limited to the declaratory action. We weren't necessarily looking uh, to pursue a, a claim for fraud, um, but it did not appear from the discovery that there was anything other than an arm's length dealing between the parties, and it didn't appear that there was any kind of deceptive activity that might might have led to a claim for fraud um, so that that what would not be something if the lawsuit was amended um, or a new lawsuit was filed absent us being able to find out any information like that it would not be a viable cause of action we we just don't believe that that's a viable cause of action. Thank you. I think, um, you know, I can speak for my colleague. I will just speak that um, my colleagues have, we have worked very hard. Um, and I think that we can all be very proud of the work that we've done for our residents and trying to move this forward. Um, they uh, have taken this, you know, we've all taken this very seriously. This We know that this is important. We know that this project is important. We know, uh, that the city, the residents, we need to see this move forward. And so I just, I, I want the residents to know that, you know, these commissioners and mayor um, over the last, you know, several months have worked very hard to, uh, to get the best result that we could for the city. And I am um, proud to uh, work with them. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Anything else? After all of you are finished, if all of you are finished, we'll move on to Ms. Rosmel. All right, any other? After her, but if not. Oh, that's fine. Well, we have Mr. Baird on the podium. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Okay. Um, just wanted to say that this is not an ideal situation. Um, I think that seeking declaratory relief was not sufficient and was more of a weak way to sue the developer i think the right thing to do would have been to sue for breach of contract for damages and to get our land back that would be the ideal situation um however as mentioned before it could be a very lengthy process where it's unsure whether we would be successful or not and it's a lot more risky for the taxpayers who would lose tax base for several more years and i do want to commend the mayor for working really hard um, in trying to seek a resolution for this. I know you've been working really hard on this and we've been working hard as well with the attorneys, with private sessions, um, and also with one-on-one -on -one sessions with the attorneys. Um, 
I know we have to find an expeditious way to move forward with this. Um, and litigation has occurred for almost three years now. So if we don't do something now, it could be another several years before we even see anything happening. And there's not even a guarantee of that. I believe it's our duty um, to protect the city and to seek the best route to move forward. And I believe that at this point, although it is not the best thing that we could have done because we could have sued for damages and we could have um, sued for breach of contract and fought harder to get our land back back in 2020, November 4, 2020. Um, at this point, it's been a couple of years and we don't wanna waste any more time. Again, we've all worked really hard to think about potential ways. I know our mayor also worked really hard to try to find the best solution for us. So I do wanna commend you for that. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate those kind words. Anything else for my colleagues, Commissioner Hay? Good. You're good. All right, Mr. Baird, thank you so much. Now I'd like to- Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioners. Thank you, Tom. And we may call you back up later, uh, depending on the questions. But now we have Catherine Rosmel, another member of our legal team. Good evening, Commission. Catherine Rosmo with Lewis Longman and Walker, part of your special counsel team um, for certain aspects of this Town Square project and particularly uh, with regard to a potential development agreement. So I'm here tonight really to just kind of highlight a few of the points that Mr. Baird has previously made, um, draw a few things out for you and, and bring a little bit of clarity on those points. Um, but as he said, and as I'll say again, and as you've heard too many times tonight, the development agreement is not actually before you, but it's important to understand um, how that will work when you're making this decision. Um, so, uh, as Mr. Baird said, the settlement agreement doesn't obligate the city to enter into a development agreement, but that development agreement will not become effective. I'm sorry, the settlement agreement will not become effective until the development agreement is entered into. Um, so they're contingent on one another. And the reason for that is that means at all times, the city is under contract with the developer, um, for the town square property. So it's important that these things happen, you know, that that turnover happens simultaneously. As a practical matter, that means to get a new developer in, JKM will need to sell the property. Um, and they are in fact under contract, we understand to do so with a group named Time Equities. Um, Time Equities has been negotiating this project longer than I have. Uh, <laughs> they've been around for many months and your legal team and your staff um, have had a number of meetings with them in person, Zoom meetings, phone calls, emails, all of the usual ways uh, and I think I can fairly represent and they have representatives here tonight and can disagree with me um, if they want but I believe that I can say we are fairly close to having a development agreement that then we would bring before you for your consideration. Um, again it's not before you tonight but if it is entered into part of that development agreement would involve a master plan and that master plan would also come before you um, and that would lay out the specific details of the project that is proposed. Um, if you choose to enter into the settlement agreement and the development agreement moves forward, again, each aspect of that would proceed as it normally would. There would be master planning, there would be site planning. Each of those would come before you at every appropriate stage. As Mr. Baird said, it would require two public meetings to approve the development agreement. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity for examination, for public comment, for response. Um, so this signing the settlement agreement um, is really just the first step in that, in that process. Um, Time Equities is here tonight. They are here tonight to introduce kind of themselves to the public and to you formally as a group. I know that you all, um, some of you have talked with them individually and you've met them. Uh, they have a number of agents with them here tonight, including I think Mr. Harvey Oyer, Mr. Bradley Miller, it looks like Robert Singer, and I know Mark Lynn, uh, their counsel, is on Zoom tonight as well. Um, and they have a PowerPoint presentation that I think we can queue up here. Um, for them to kind of run through a little bit of, of who they are and what they're thinking about for this project. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have right now, um, or if you want to hear from them and then call me back however you'd like to handle it. Thank you, Catherine. Um, since the development agreement is not the subject of tonight's item, I'd like to hear the presentation from Mr. Singer, and this way he can tell us a little bit about time equities, and then we'll open the floor to questions and comments from my colleagues. Okay. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Either one. All the microphones work. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> you have to dance there. That's the hot zone. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, good, good evening, Mayor, Commission, for the record, Harvey Oyer of Shutton Bowen. I'm a land use and zoning lawyer, native of Boynton Beach, uh, and I represent Time Equities not only in, in this matter or hopeful matter in your community, but in their other recent project in Palm Beach County, which I think all but one of you physically visited, as did a lot of your senior staff. It's called the Casa Mara Project. It's on Dixie Highway on the west side of Dixie, just south of Belvedere Road, um, near um, the confluence of some historic neighborhoods like El Cid, as well as the uh, Dixie Commercial Corridor. So I have known Rob Singer and the other principals of the company for probably a decade. Uh, I, I would characterize them as best in class developers. Uh, Casa Mara has been a hugely successful project. Uh, one of the uh, real stars of West Palm Beach's renaissance. And uh, I was proud to be part of the project. I'm proud to be part of this one in my hometown, of course. And I think you're presented with a great opportunity to make lemonade out of the lemons that were served up to you due to no fault of anyone in this room. But that is what you were handed when you were sworn in. And I think this is a terrific resolution. And I will share with you why. Uh, because the very best case scenario for you, should you not settle this, is to go through a very lengthy, expensive trial, which you could lose, which means you would then lose everything. And in the best outcome, you would win, and you would win the right to make that developer specifically perform a project that they clearly don't want to do, and, or they would have done it in the greatest market in the modern era of South Florida and you would lose millions of dollars in tax revenue that you would be collecting had that developer developed it or a different developer were to develop now. So even though we're all frustrated with the situation and probably no one is more frustrated than you guys, this is a very elegant solution. It gives you four and a half million dollars back the way your attorney team who are wonderful professionals have structured this, you're not at risk. Uh, and you get the same development that you bargained for or your predecessors bargained for. In fact, I'd argue a better development and a better developer, which will mean more revenue and more value to your community. And that is what we experienced in West Palm Beach with Casa Mara. It was additive to the entire neighborhood. In fact, um, not often in my career have I had opponents of a project come back to me after the project and say, we were wrong. We wish we had been supportive of that. And some of those folks who had opposed it actually moved into the project. Uh, so it was a big victory for everyone. And I would like my hometown of Boynton Beach to experience that same victory. And I think that opportunity is before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oyer. Mr. Singer. Okay, great. Um, I'm Robert Singer, Director of Development for Time Equities and had the pleasure of meeting everybody. Um, I, I was asked to, because obviously the public doesn't know who Time Equities is, I was asked to put together a few slides to introduce ourselves and sort of our core capacity. Um, so if that's all right with everybody, we can click through them quick. Um, okay. Uh, first here we have Mr. Greenberger, who is the founder, and he will be here in subsequent meetings, but he's the, the founder and owner of Time Equities. Um, and um, Mr. Cantor, who's the, the president, you'll, you'll meet them in due time. We keep going. This is just a quick snapshot, frankly, from the website. I mean, it's, what it says is we've been in business, the company's been in business for 56 years, has 190 employees, 38 million plus square feet of operating real estate and um, in eight countries and six, over $6 billion in assets. We can... Um, we can move forward. So Time Equities is interesting because it, not only do we have a, a very large operating portfolio, but we're also, um, we're also a, a developer, not a fee developer, not somebody who runs around, frankly, and tries to build other people's money and, and tries to flip and, and is sort of less caring about communities. We, we do one, like, significant project at a time we put everything we have into it and we hold that project like Casamara and other ones I'll show you 
Um, we're very, very community-based and want, you know, in need to for success for everyone to win. Development doesn't work unless unless communities win and developers win. So um, that's part of our ethos here. So what we've just shown here is there's four quick little, not even case studies, but there's 50 West Street. Um, which was a condominium building that we built which with a $500 million budget and completed in 2017. There's another skyscraper that were uh, 738 rental units that's under construction right now. Goldman Sachs is the construction lender. Um, that'll be done in a couple of years. And then there was a mid-rise, I just pulled these, a mid-rise um, uh, rental building in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then and then Casa Mara. So so quickly, just to click through the first one up, if we click forward, is 50 West Street. Um, this was a, a public-private endeavor, not not too dissimilar down by World Trade Center. It's a major skyline tower. Um, this represents um, this was our hometown, and this was completed in the last cycle. Um, going forward. We have, um, this is now 1000 South Michigan. This is a rendering as is the next slide. <clears throat> and what you can see here is this is a 73 story building um, right on Grant Park in Chicago with beautiful views, forever views. Uh, if we click one more, you'll see that this was a couple months ago. This is the building coming up. And now the next slide shows shows about where we are today. So this is like active construction, real, <laughs> real financed, really happening. All of these things are, um, and and frankly, after this one is wrapped up in the next year or two, while we're into the under the um, while we're working through the details in Boynton Beach, Boynton Beach will be next. This is a podium parking sort of standard 18-story rental building that we finished recently, and then finally, if you go to the next one is. Is Casamara, which is obviously um, a different style project than the other ones you've seen. Um, this one we call it resort style. It's sort of spread out over 10 acres. Um, if we if we keep just clicking through um, courtyards, these are some exterior shots with retail. Um, what this shows, interestingly, I thought this could be useful for the for the public and for the commission. This is what it was before. It was a sort of a defunct, obsolete former Sears that had nobody in it. It was a big. It was a, just a 10-acre nothing, like just adding no value to the community at all. But it was zoned office, and so in order, so we had to go to the community with <laughs> with Harvey and say. We bought this property. We'd like to turn it into something great, and we worked through a number of design iterations. But if we click forward, you'll see. Um, okay, so this is the context of the of the site. The more context. Keep going here. All right. So this is literally on Dixie Highway. What people, which if you go back to the parking lot, I mean, this is what people saw for forever. I mean, for literally forever. And we 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 said, look, we can. This is a great location. Everyone said, well, it's, are you sure? This doesn't seem to make sense. Whatever. And we said, no, no, no. This is going to be excellent for the community. So we show we if we go forward now, we started a process where we started massing out how the project could could function and click forward. Um, started rendering it up, and just now we can just kind of click through here. There, keep clicking. We. Um, we showed everybody, then we started construction right away. We knocked the whole thing down, demoed it, um, keep going. You can see here by 19, we were out of the ground. We keep going. By 20, we were making great progress. And uh, then just to finish up, I mean, this is what it is today. You can kind of click through a lot of you. Um, we're able to come and see it, but um, it's done really well, and and we're super proud of it because, as Harvey said, uh, you know there there were people who were concerned about us from New York or from you know wherever, and what are you doing? And this seems is this you know what do you, this seems scary or this seems might be wrong. And we worked with everyone for a long time, and the the proof is in the pudding that a lot of the people who in the neighborhoods in the historic neighborhoods um, they they live there now. 
And I think, um, I mean, I just wanted to put more emphasis. We, we do stuff all over the world, literally all over the world. And, um, but I wanted to put more emphasis on that project because obviously it relates as closest to home. Um, so it's a different, it's gonna, it's a different scale project, it's different um, massing probably, but the point is the ethos and working together. So, so that's, that's who we are. We're a large company that has real assets does one development at a time, we care, we are gonna hold these properties forever. Um, at least that's always been the plan as it is for these. So um, so I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for all of the work that you guys have done on all of this with the settlement, with trying to understand who we are and, and planning and staff have been incredible. Um, and I guess I just, Ask Bradley to say a few words about that interaction because he's been there on the front lines for a year now or so since we've been in contract, helping us think about the project, design it, sees our, our professionals, works with the city. So Bradley, you'd love to hear your perspective on the process. Sure. Thank you, Robert. Bradley Miller, uh, I'm the land planner with Urban Design Studio, uh, 610 Clematis Street. Um, been here many times, been working here in the city for probably 20, 25 years uh, specifically, um, as well as uh, other places in Palm Beach County. And uh, Urban Design Studio, I wasn't personally involved in Casa Mara, but Urban Design Studio was, so our relationship with Time Equities goes, goes back a long ways. I can say in my 30 plus years of doing what I do, I don't think I've met anybody that has the the clout and the the knowledge um, and the the wherewithal to make this happen. Uh, this is I uh, picked up on Mr. Baird's comment of you'll probably get a better project. You're going to get a better project. And um, working with with your staff, with with uh, Amanda and and Jay and with Adam in working our way up to a point where I'm gonna have more of a presentation to you. You'll be sick of me by the end of it. Um, it they've, they've been amazing. They've been available um, uh, and, and working with us all along to be able to make this happen. So it's, um, it, it's exciting. I've, uh, I've told my, my wife, I said, if I can see Town Square come out of the ground, I've done my job. So I Thank encourage you. you to push this forward. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen, Mr. Oyer, Mr. Miller, Mr. Singer. The way we'll proceed is while you gentlemen are up on the podium, I'll open the floor to any questions or comments from my colleagues, specifically to this group here, the Time, Equ Time Equities Group. If uh, there are no questions or after we've concluded, we'll go back to our attorneys for any final questions or comments. After that, we'll go to public comment on this item and we'll return for final voting. All right, so questions or comments for the Time Equities Group. Commissioner Hay, let's begin with you. I would like to say I, I do feel very comfortable uh, for, I haven't felt that way in a long time. I, I know uh, these two gentlemen to my right and your left, uh, Bradley Miller, of course, and Harvey Oyer. And Rob, I got an opportunity to meet you uh, and uh, I can see nothing but uh, but the green light here. The big concern was the finance. Uh, and I don't see that based on what I was shown. So to me, that concern is out because I know you guys have put your heart into the different projects that you uh, have helped to come out of the ground. So that's not a problem. I'm just looking forward to, um, to work with you guys. And uh, I just know we're gonna have a great project here. Uh, with you guys on it. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, urban design, uh, Bradley, where you've gone and they are a, a great company. Uh, I just just can't say nothing but the best for, for what I see in the future. And I don't see this scenario repeating itself. Uh, and I would love to see this completed in my lifetime. So thank you guys uh, for what you've shown thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hay, Vice Mayor Cruz. Any questions or comments for the Time Equities Group? Thank you for coming today and showing um, that you're able to fund your project. It's really important for us and Bradley Miller. And, um, you know, thank, thank you all for coming as well. Um, 
wanted to thank you guys for giving us hope for the future. I know it's been tumultuous. It's been negative for since 2020, honestly, and seeing a positive way out where it could be hopefully a win-win situation. Um, it's, it's something that makes me happy. It's something that I hope makes my constituents happy and the residents of the city. Um, thank you, Harvey, as well for coming in today and, and presenting. And yeah, it gives me a lot of hope. It's a beautiful project. I was able to see it as well a couple of months ago or maybe more than that. It's been a while, um, but it is a beautiful project. And in seeing a project of that magnitude in our city would definitely be a positive situation for us. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, uh, Commissioner Turkin, any questions or comments? Nope. Um, my colleague explained <clears throat> the concern for funding, so it's it's good that there's no concern there. Um, I live on Southwest Second. One of those parcels are on Southeast Second. So every time I walk to a commission meeting, I look at that empty blue lot. And um, that was one of the reasons that I threw my name in the hat to be in this chair that I'm in now. And um, I don't want to be brash, but you know, when if we move forward, when it comes when it comes to uh, site plan approval and and what we're what we're going to be looking at, I'm I'm going to go I'm going to go to bat again. But I hope we can get something great done um, because I know not just myself, but uh, the residents here in District Three they're sick of looking at these empty lots and everyone else who comes to downtown. And so um, you know, let's let's get something done and. You know, let's make sure it's a mutual benefit for everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Turkin. Commissioner Kelly. I just um, kind of wanted to touch on what the colleagues, what my colleagues had said, and just thank you for coming. Um, I think it's important that the residents. It was important that we hear, um, you know, hear from you and hear from um, from both of you uh, to just kind of get some peace of mind that we're moving this in the right direction. Um, and that you're taking it personally. Our city is important to us. I know, Harvey, it's very important to you. Bradley Miller, it is important to you. You've been here a long time too. So um, this is our this is our city. Yep. And so to hear from you and to hear that you um, that you're gonna you know hang on to this and and it's it's as precious to you as it is to us. I you know just I appreciate you coming and taking the time to to share with us. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. All of our questions and comments have now concluded for the Time Equities Group. Mr. Oyer, would you like to follow up? Or, no, oh. other than to thank you all. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, thank now, you all. Uh, any final questions or comments to any of our legal team members from our commission? Do you have any questions or comments from or for our legal team? All right, seeing none, I'd like now to proceed to public comments on this item. Again, this is uh, proposed resolution number R23-008. This is the approval of the settlement agreement. That is the item before us. There is not a development plan before us, only the settlement agreement, uh, which can only be effectuated when all pieces have been uh, executed. That includes a development agreement, which will proceed on a separate occasion uh, through the proper channels in the public eye. Uh, so if you would like to speak specifically on this item, now would be the time to approach the podium. We'll begin with those in person, followed by those online. All right. All right, begin when you're ready and state your name for the record. Good evening, Mayor. Commissioners, for the record, my name is Tom Ramiccio. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, let me first say welcome to Time Equities. Uh, I think it's refreshing that we're gonna have a developer that will be able to perform and be able to build something exciting and great for downtown. So. My comments tonight are welcome to time equities, but I'm still concerned about the settlement agreement. I agree that we need to settle this and move forward. Time is of the essence for this project, and we've lost an awful lot of time. My concern is the way we got to this settlement. I heard Mr. Baird and others on the legal team say that they heard that time equities was coming, and we're welcoming them. My concern is you've had seven or eight shade sessions where time equities was discussed in the shade instead of in the public, which should have happened once the developer was presented 
since you were dealing with the settlement of a lawsuit, a current pending litigation, you should then have closed the shade session, opened the public session, all government is in the sunshine. It's to be conducted in front of the public. And so it's just troubling that we've had all of these shade sessions. And it's interesting that certain commissioners bring up the options agreement. Remember the options agreement would have allowed the city to get their property back. But it was two weeks after a certain commissioner in December of 18 was appointed to this commission that that options agreement was signed and it allowed the developer then to do something else. So my concern is the process that has taken place. My concern is the lack of transparency, even tonight to hear our own attorneys, Mr. Baird say that he understood that there was a contract. He knows there was a contract. He was in the shade sessions. Now I've requested all of the minutes, which won't be available until the settlement comes through and I'll review them, but we'll move on. We have time equities, they're a great firm, they'll be able to perform, and that's what's important going forward. But we have to afterwards, Mayor, you asked in 2020, in June, for an investigation, you should at least take a cursory look and figure out what happened here, and then fix your legal processes that you have to follow and conduct all the business in the sunshine. And then please, whoever drafted this document, it looks very familiar, to the documents that were drafted originally, and they're not in favor of the city. It continually refers to the options agreement, conversations, uh, things that may come up in the future. It's just scary that this is being approved, but we have a good project going forward, and I thank you for your time. Happy New Year. Thank you. Next speaker, please approach the podium. Happy New Year, Mr. Kerr George. New Year. Who are you? Um, as someone who worked in development for over 20 years in this county, and I don't want to dwell on the past. The past is the past. It's history now. We need to move forward. I urge you to approve the settlement agreement. I'm not a big fan of contingency plans. You know why? Because there's words like if and but and when. And it, those things make me nervous because they're not guarantees. But I have found out that there are very little guarantees in life. And, uh, but I do urge you to go forward with this settlement agreement because at this point, it's the best you can do. To continue with litigation, only people that win it when you continue with litigation are the attorneys. They're laughing all the way to the bank at your expense and at the taxpayer's expense. That is one of the main reasons that I urge you to move forward with the settlement agreement. You have a good developer, okay, coming on board. Your closed door sessions, I'm sorry. I've been in closed door sessions when I served on the CRA board. Okay, you need, you have attorneys there, you have court reporters there for a reason, okay? But what you're doing is you're trying to achieve the best results in a very candid forum without the public, okay? Because sometimes you're gonna say things that need to be said and sometimes you, it's like making sausage. It's not pretty, okay? But you have to do it. And I mean, some people, they could go back to the CRA minutes of some of the closed door sessions and they'd be surprised at some of the things that were said. But they needed to be said and we needed to move forward on those things. And I'm happy that we did. Please approve this unanimously to agree to the settlement agreement. Thank you. Can you please state your name for the record? Mark Kara George. All right, thank you. I see another speaker. Move quickly, Harry Woodward. 
One, one second. It sounds like your microphone turned off. Wrong one? Oh, no, didn't touch it. Uh, anyhow, could you say your name for the record? Harry Woodworth, uh, representing again. The, the, the concern a lot of us has had for this, I guess it's no secret to some of you, we've shared it, is this has all been behind the closed doors. We haven't seen any. I can't tell you how refreshing it was tonight to see that you guys have switched the emphasis from making this a legal problem to making it a development problem. We don't need more lawyers. We need the developer. It looks like they've got a good one. And I guess from our communities, and we got 12 communities that line the intercoastal that have been watching this in great disgust. And 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 you know, come on, people, you, you now have the solution. Uh, there are some contingencies, but let's go forward with this. And we really need somebody, the caliper of these guys, I'm not a development person, but it looks pretty good. Uh, we've had some real Mickey Mouse developers in this town, and these guys aren't one of them. So, you know, let's do something right and move this thing forward and just really encourage you to, you know, the sunk cost is the sunk cost. You can't change it. Let's move this thing forward and get something out of that grass that we drive by every day and that disgusting blue tarp. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other, this is last call for in-person public comments. Seeing none, in-person public comments are now closed. We're gonna move to those online. Mani, does anybody have their digital hands raised? Mr. May, we have one hand raised, Ramona Young. All right. Ramona, you're on mute, go ahead. I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining and uh, please state your name for the record. Ramona, you need to click the microphone one more time. There you go. Ramona Young, uh, 101 South Federal Highway. I would say bravo, bravo, let's move forward but let's remain transparent. It is so paramount that things not be done without being, without being transparent. We've had a lot of issues in this town where people were not transparent and some of them wound up in jail. Um, so let's keep above, be above board. Um, and good luck and happy new year. Thank you and happy new year to you as well. All right, money, just double checking. Is there anyone else? Otherwise yes, we have concluded. No, sir, that, that was, was the last one. All right, excellent. Um, now we will open the floor for any final questions or comments from my colleagues. And if there are none, I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution number R23-008. So and move, so move, second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner uh, Turkin and a second from Commissioner Hay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. I just have one comment, Mayor, for time equities. Yes. I just asked when you guys um, you know, start looking at your site plan to go to those residents that live on Southeast um, Second Avenue that will be directly in front of whatever is going to be developed there and, um, you know, a ask them, you know, what they're, uh, what they can deal with, you know, because from my understanding, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really close. And so, you know, I know that I see affiliated here and they've, they've gone out and talked to the community and, and really worked with them. So if you could do those residents, you know, a service and do that. I'd appreciate it. You know, if you can knock on their doors, just like I did. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Turkin. Are there any other final comments? All right, hearing none, we're gonna to proceed to the next item on the agenda. And if I remember correctly, we moved up item 8A. Is that correct, Vice Mayor? Uh, yes. All right, this item is approval of variance. And this is a quasi judicial matter. And as such, I'm going to turn now to council to outline the procedure uh, of how we'll of how we'll proceed. One at a table this item. Um, that's correct. Uh, but before we entertain that motion, I at least want to a let's pause for a moment for the people to leave the chambers, and uh, b just hear from our colleagues here if they would like to hear the presentation at all. Or if not, we can proceed to entertaining uh, Commissioner Turkin's motion. Comment? Sure, Vice Mayor, go ahead. Motion, to make comment. No, no, go ahead, just make a comment. Okay. Hmm, yeah, um, 
I guess looking at this and the reason why I moved it up, I didn't want them to continue to wait until we continue to do the meeting. That's understandable. Um, but as we're thinking about this, um, I think it would be a benefit to the city, to the residents and to the board um, to look at the site plan as we're looking at any variances of that sort so that we can see a holistic view of what the project looks like, what it's going to look like, what it's gonna require and that sort of thing um, in order to move forward. And then that's all I'm gonna say mm. today. All right, based on what I've heard from you, Vice Mayor, Commissioner Turkin, and the head nod I saw from Commissioner Kelly, uh, the motion would be to continue this item uh, to the next city commission meeting. And can I get confirmation on the date? That would be two weeks from tonight would be the 17th. On the 17th, 17th. all right. Uh, what the motion is, would be. Is that the date when we're gonna see the site plan? Um, I believe that would be Mr. Max. And is coming up. Um, we do have Amanda as well. The question, <clears throat> Vice Mayor, why don't you repeat yes, the it, question? Is it, are you asking, is it possible to see this variance in conjunction with the site plan at the same time? Correct. I, 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 I'd like to do that as well. Good evening, Amanda Radigan, the Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, the site plan is not scheduled to go in front of um, City Commission at the next meeting. Uh, currently, they are targeting to um, be in front of P&D Board. Um, on January 24th. After that, they would um, move forward to their city commission meeting, which would be February 21st. Um, in the interest of time, I know, you know, uh, Affiliated has a lot of things to do. They've been working on this for a long time. I understand Commissioner Turkin, you wanted to table this, but if we could have a few minutes of discussion, I think it would be a great benefit to the city as well as to affiliated and to us as a commission to maybe talk about some ideas and perspectives as we go forward and we don't waste a month before, you know, February 21st until we meet again. Whatever y'all think is. Um, can we have the possibility to move that up? I mean, can we ask affiliated, is that time an issue? Um, one second. Before you respond to that, Commissioner Turkin, I want to turn to Council for just a brief moment to ensure that we're following proper protocol. Um, there is a quasi-judicial process, and so is it all right if we continue with this discussion? It, it, as long as you're not talking about the variance and the merits of the variance itself, and you're okay. talking about process and, and how you can move forward, um, then that's fine. If we want to, if you're going to start getting into the the variance application itself, you would need to decide whether to open the the hearing or to okay. continue at that point. But so long as you're talking holistically and trying to understand the best way to proceed, then um, you're not taking any testimony or evidence, you're not prejudging any applications, Correct. so that's fine. All right, sounds good. Um, Commissioner Turkin, you were saying something, let's address your question first. I mean, if if time's a concern um, for affiliated, is, would that work for you? I mean, in, in staff? Well, the, the most expeditious, that would be the most expeditious timeline to get the site plan in front of you, since the variance of request is not legally tied to the site plan, the variance can move at a different pace. If the goal is to see them together, the dates that I outlined would be the quickest way to get it in front of the board. Okay, great. If we want to have any discussion, just to make sure that we're following protocol, should we like have a motion a second and start discussion on this or? We're having a discussion on it right now, it's fine. Um, but if you'd like to continue this item, uh, the motion would be a motion to continue to the next city commission meeting. But if the, is the, is the discussion about the process or? Sorry. Go ahead. Vice right no. Mayor, I'm trying to understand. Uh, well, my thought is affiliates here, they spend their time driving here, sitting here, waiting a couple hours for us to just table it and if i were them i would like to at least know what's happening or maybe have a little bit of discussion if that's beneficial and if so then i'll go ahead and make a motion to start discussion so we can go over this and you know talk about the variance and or maybe other additional avenues that we could take uh, for the record uh, jeff burns uh, ceo of affiliated development mayor and city commission thanks for having us um by the way, for the record, I'm very excited about the Town Square project. You know, this is something I think is going to help out uh, East Point and Beach as a whole and really make it the, the community that everybody um, is excited about in, in the future. So uh, to, to address your question, um, listen, we completely understand um, 
why you would want to understand the variance as it relates to the the totality of the site plan and how and how it impacts uh, the site plan. So, uh, listen, my team's been working around the clock over the holidays to make sure that we were getting uh, items. City staff, city staff has been terrific to work with in terms of. Um, you know, working with our team to get this site plan in as good a shape as possible. So um, we're um, definitely on board. It doesn't impact our timing. Uh, we plan on going before the planning and development board uh, this month and, and getting before you in February. And that'll give us some time to, to really sit down and kind of explain and walk through uh, the merits of the projects. There's been a lot of decisions that have been made, a lot of changes that have been made throughout this uh, experience. And uh, and I think that'll give us the appropriate amount of time to uh, to do that and make sure that everybody understands uh, how this came to be. So you don't mind waiting? Correct. Okay. All right. Anything else for my colleagues? All right. So council. So I guess the question is, I mean, I want to the motion on the table. Do you want to continue it to the next meeting or do you want to continue it to a future date certain? If you do it to a, if you continue it to a date certain, it doesn't necessarily have to be re-advertised. It may be re-advertised, but you provide that option if it's doesn't if it's going to come back individually. I, I would assume that if it comes back as part of a site plan, they'd re-advertise it anyway. But it's really your call if you want to um, make it you don't have to do it to the next meeting, in other words. Yeah. I, I think um, in conjunction with the site plan would be good. It's kind of where my head's at. And is that something we can accomplish within the next meeting? I'm sorry, within the next meeting. Yes. <clears throat> could, could we see these items in the, the next meeting in this month? This, the site plan? No, the, yeah, the site plan, I don't. I think the site plan, no. So the site, the process for site plan okay. approval is that it would go to our planning and development board meeting on January 24th, and then it would come to city commission after that. So we just received a final set of plans on Friday, and it's currently being reviewed. So staff doesn't have um, staff reports done or a recommendation from the P&D board yet. So the process would be P&D board this month, and then it would be February 21st for our public hearing um, <clears throat> for the site plan in front of city commission. All right, sounds good. I wasn't aware of the date for P and D. But thank 24. you for clarification. I appreciate that. All right, um, if there's nothing else, the motion is to continue this. Um, continue it to February 21st. Is that I, an appropriate I memo? That's what I heard. <laughs> I'm not looking at a calendar. I believe that's the second meeting in February. Can we please double check so we have this proper? Because yeah, Valentine's Day is a Tuesday. Second I meeting. know that. I've yeah. <laughs> not clicked that night. I do now. <laughs> 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 so it would be the 21st. Yeah, keep, keep Commissioner Hay with us. Yeah. All right. So um, <laughs> Commissioner Turkin, if you'd like to make the motion uh, I'd like to make clarifying the mo February 21st. I'd like to make the motion to table this item to the February 21st meeting in conjunction with the first public hearing. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second to, to continue this item to February 21st. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion passes unanimously. I will see you again February 21st. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you, Ms. Radigan. We are now moving on to the next item under public hearing, which is 8B, proposed ordinance number 22-024. This is a second reading, and as such, we will have public comment on this item. Ms. Radigan, you're at the podium. Would you like to reintroduce this item? Good evening, Commission. Um, again, there have been no changes between first and second reading. Um, if there are any questions, I am available. All right, thank you. Commissioner. <clears throat> Commissioner Turkin, this is your item. Would you like to begin? Um, no, I think I've been pretty uh, pretty vocal on this um, over the last six six seven months. You know, we're here. Um, I I am going to repeat my um, ask for lowering that density from 70 units to 60. And um, you know, I'd like to make a motion to approve this with the amendment to 60 units per acre. All right, we have a motion uh, to approve this resolution with the amendment as stated, moving the density of MU4 to 60. 
I just click on that. units per acre and we have i'm sorry just to clarify it's for mixed use downtown mixed use downtown i apologize i was looking at the wrong item and we do have a second from uh, commissioner hay uh, before we proceed to the roll call i'd like to hear now for public comment on this right. item i do yes. need to read the title oh it's i'm sorry ordinance. council you do <laughs> yes we, we we jumped immediately to it, amanda it did, and that's fine right. i was going to get there all right in or, in, in, it's ordinance an ordinance of the city of boynton beach florida approving the establishment of the mixed use downtown mudt zoning district cdrv 22-004 amending part two land development regulations chapter three article three section one e table three dash four mixed use urban buildings and site regulations and section five c1 building and site regulations table three dash two two providing for complex severability codification and effective date. And as you indicated, this is a public hearing. That's right. Uh, let's proceed now to public comment. We now have a motion and a second. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Now's the time to approach the podium, after which we will proceed to those public comment speakers online. All right, Ms. Oyer, welcome back. Uh, yeah, you got a break tonight. <laughs> we didn't even have to tag team up here. Um, Susan Oyer, Boynton Beach. Um, once again, I'm going to say how incredibly disappointed I am at this. This really needs to go down. Once again, in the 80s, we voted as residents of the city of Boynton Beach for a four-story maximum. This is a moot point because you've already built out almost everything that can be built in downtown and, and whatever's coming up that is obscenely high, not wanted by any of the residents, is not going to be safe, and is just going to be an ugly eyesore so this is just making ourselves look good, like we actually give a damn about what the residents think. And we really don't because we would go to the four stories, 48 foot approximately max that, you know, the residents voted for with over 90% of the residents of this city voting for that. And you're continuing to ignore, this is once again, another commission ignoring what the residents voted for. End of story, we voted. I don't know how you all can even look in the mirror and go, oh my gosh, I want to have it 60 feet or, or 55 feet even. That is over what the residents voted for. Flat out end of story. And I shouldn't have to come up here every single time and remind you of what the residents voted for at approximately 93% of the city voting for that. We have seldom as a city come together the way we came together. On, on voting against height. And you continue to ignore that. And now we're sitting here with gross oversized buildings left and right, 10, 12 stories, whatever's come in our direction. Look at the nonsense on Wolverine and US1. I mean, I know people who will never go to Josie's again. They will never go to Walgreens again, Joanne's Fabrics. The, all those stores have, have took a hit because no one wants to go there because it's so bad and so ugly and the traffic's so horrible and it's not well planned out. And you're doing that again with the Two Georges project over there. What is that? Legacy Boynton or whatever it's called this week. I mean, these are just hideous, awful projects. And I, I, I mean, I know we can't go back and do anything, but there's gotta be a way that we can start stopping this craziness. And we've got to start listening to the residents. And so, yeah, this is just another happy, you know, placate people kind of thing, make ourselves look good. But again, it's still a gross violation of what the residents voted for, which was four story maximum and approximately 93% of the city voted for that. So this, and even though it's an improvement, you're right, Commissioner Turkin, it's an improvement. It still violates what the residents voted for. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next public comment speaker. Harry Woodworth, uh, again, I'd like to just represent the Inca communities as I'm a director. Um, we did not coordinate. I've gotten up here, I don't know, hundreds of times since 1984, pretty much talking about the same thing, the ridiculous density that keeps getting shoved down our throats. One time, 14 of us got together and prevailed over Lennar and got the 48-foot building 10 feet from ours run out of town. With every other case we lost, I appreciate the effort to get it down, honest I do. 
Uh, it's a, the ship has sailed. We've got all this overbuilt stuff, the stuff that's coming out of the ground now, you've, you've cheated and moved it in and made it higher. The people have been saying the same thing up here, myself and dozens of others, hundreds sometimes, people outside by the hundreds, and we have yet to be heard. It's too damn big. It's too damn tall. It's too dense. You're never going to have the, the railroad thing. You don't have the density. You don't have the space. You don't have the business. What is the damn plan? Start looking around and listening to the people. We'd like a town that looks like something, not like a bunch of high-rise buildings that sit around half empty. I mean, you're on the right track. You're 20 years too late with it. But for just once, maybe listen to the people of this committee and say, stop it, enough is enough. Put the damn things back from the road, bring them down a little bit, give people some space to breathe. I do 15,000 miles a year in my camper. Never once got enough an interstate to come to a town like this. It's ridiculous what we've done to this town. It was better in the 80s, folks, and you're not making it any better. Oh, maybe these guys will come and do something. But this is just absurd that we just keep sticking this stuff up there. Bigger, bigger, bigger. New York with sunshine. Wow. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else in the chambers that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to proceed now to those online. Mani, do we have anybody with their digital hands raised? Mr. Mayor, we have one hand raised, Gregory Hartman. All Gregory, right. please click the microphone next to your name. Mr. Thank Hartman, you. I will Great. let you know you have 30 seconds remaining. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, Commission and members attending. My name is Gregory Hartman, 1083 Southwest 25th Place, Boynton Beach. Uh, I heard what Commissioner Turkin was saying just a few minutes ago before comments open, and I'd like to speak in support of his amendment to bring the density down a little. Uh, while I understand there is historical precedent to uh, bring the height down in, in turn density down, kind of the cat's out of the bag with where we are. I believe the height exemption is fine, and I believe the density that uh, Commissioner Turkin was requesting would be a reasonable compromise to keep our, you know, I understand we need to have a certain density, a certain height to make these projects feasible. And I think what Commissioner Turkin has recommended is more than feasible. Uh, I think he's over the target per usual, and I believe there was a second from Commissioner Hay, and I want to commend them both for uh, taking bold action and doing what the residents and the uh, people of Boynton Beach really want them to do, which is to keep height low and keep density low. Uh, Boynton Beach, uh, we have a lot going on, uh, and with more people, the problems will only get bigger and worse. Um, and as pointed out earlier, the traffic along Woolbright and Federal has become uh, a big problem. So keeping density lower will help us do that. And also a better environmental impact. The less people here, the less uh, impact there is on our resources. And that's something we can all applaud and look forward to. Thank you again for your time, Commission. Happy New Year. Thank you and Happy New Year as well. Uh, is there anybody else online, Mani? Yes, sir. That was the last one. Seeing none, public comments on this item are now closed. We have a motion before us from Commissioner Turkin with an amendment and a second from Commissioner Hay. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. It's a roll call vote. And uh, Madam Clerk, <laughs> why does it always happen? Uh, Madam Clerk, please begin the roll call. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Turkin? Yes. Commissioner Hay? Yes. Vice Mayor Cruz? Yes. Mayor Panserga? It's a yes. In a roll call vote, the motion passed unanimously. All right. Congratulations, Commissioner Turkin. I know this was very important to you. This is a step in the right direction, yeah. and a major accomplishment. Yeah, step in the right direction. And I think it's from what we've talked about as a body over the last few meetings, this was a win-win situation to not get sued by this by anyone on a Burt J. Harris claim and uh, make sure that we can continue to have responsible development, you know, in our awesome town while listening to the residents and not making a huge impact. So I want to commend my colleagues for doing the right thing. I appreciate it. And I, I know the residents do as well. Thank you. And I also want to thank city staff. You guys worked so hard on this and, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was real bull about this. So thank you for putting up with me. It's uh, very appreciated. So just, you know, uh, take it as me being passionate. I hope you guys realize that. Thank you, Amanda. All right, anything else? All right, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business 10A. Approve updated eligibility requirements and total funding amount for the ARPA Small Business Assistance Grant Program. At the podium, we have Mr. John Durgan, 
Mr. Durgan, would you like to introduce this item? And I believe there's a PowerPoint to go along with it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, John Durgan, Economic Development Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. So this item is being uh, brought back to update the eligibility requirements as well as the funding amount for our ARPA Small Business Assistance Grant Program. Uh, next slide, please. The items on this slide present some of the feedback the commission um, gave to us at the at the last commission meeting um, after our presentation, some of the feedback the commission wanted to see. So um, some of the feedback was prioritizing those small businesses that did not receive any sort of COVID relief um, from the CRA, um, from the city or Palm Beach County. It was also um, brought back to staff to create some sort of tiered system um, to determine the, the total funding amount small businesses can receive um, from the grant program, determining a total funding amount for the actual program, how much of our ARPA funds will be allocated to this program, and then potentially capping the amount of, of funding for businesses within the CRA district. And then lastly, capping the max amount um, per grant at $20,000. Next slide, please. So the next slide actually is the items that um, staff would like to finalize for the program funding as well as the eligibility requirements for the program. Like I mentioned like I mentioned before, prioritizing small businesses that have not received any sort of COVID-19 relief from the city, from the Boynton Beach CRA, or for Palm Beach County. And one of the ways we can um, issue those funding is potentially creating multiple rounds of funding. So for example, we can have um, a first round for those who have not received any sort of funding. So we would create the application, the portal, um, we would open the, the program up, for example, for two months, 60 days, um, for those who have not received any sort of funding, um, previous COVID funding. Um, and then once that's over, whatever funding's left, we can um, apply to those who have received some sort of funding, but still also meet all the eligibility requirements of the program. Again, we have to determine a total um, amount of funding allocated to the program, potentially capping the amount of funding for businesses within the Boynton Beach CRA, um, capping the funding amount per grant at 20,000. This, this next um, bullet I added in there, um, based off of some research I did from documents and tax returns from previous programs that we administered, um, looking at some of the thresholds um, for eligibility. So in the, in the previously approved program, um, to be eligible for the program, you had, you had to have annual gross sales and receipts of $3 million or less. Um, staff is recommending to, to bump that to, to $5 million or less. We do have a lot of small businesses in the city that do have large sales, but they also have large expenses. So I wanted to capture those um, in the program that, that did have larger uh, sales, but also um, with larger sales comes those larger operating costs. And then finally, selecting a tiered system that determines the total amount of grant funding for eligible small businesses. Um, Mayor, I can go to the next slide um, that talks about those tiered options, then I'll go back to the previous slides so we can go um, through each item um, for those approvals. So option one um, is basing the tiered system off a percentage decrease in gross revenue year over year. So, so comparing any year, whether it's 19, 20, 2021, um, with your um, decrease in gross, um, a percentage in decrease in, in gross revenue. Um, if your business experienced that um, percentage decrease in gross revenue of 25% or more, they would be eligible for the max of $20,000. 11 to 24%, they would be eligible for 15,000. And then anywhere between um, 10 and 1%, they'd be eligible for $10,000. And again, that's based off of your percentage decrease in gross revenue. The second option would be a percentage decrease in net income. Um, this is gonna be your gross revenue minus all your, your company's operating expenses, the cost of goods sold, um, and all, all the costs incurred to operate your business. This brings into account some of the workforce inflation issues um, that, that did come into play here. And again, 25% or more um, decrease, you're eligible for $20,000. 11 to 24% decrease in the net income, you're eligible for 15. And then anywhere between 10 and 1%, you're eligible for $10,000. And option three, it just takes into consideration your gross revenue. Um, you still have to demonstrate you lost um, some sort of revenue. And one of the requirements will be that you have to, the, the amount of grant funding you're requesting, you have to at least experience that um, amount of loss. So for the third option, it's just gonna be your gross revenue as a business. Um, so if you make less than $500,000, you'd be eligible for, for $20,000, anywhere between 500,000 and just under a million, you'd be eligible for $15,000. And then if you make um, over a million, 
dollars in your gross revenue, you'd be eligible for ten thousand um, dollars. But again, you have to demonstrate that you lost at least that amount um, to be eligible. So those are the three tier options. Again, up to the commission how, how you would like for us to tier it. Um, and if we can go back to the previous slide, we can go um, through each item um, to discuss finalizing these uh, items for the eligibility. So again, we can prioritize those businesses that have not received any sort of COVID-19 relief um, currently. And how we can do that is we can issue multiple rounds of funding uh, for small businesses, like I mentioned, opening up a round one for those who didn't receive any funding, and then um, having that second round for those, um, whatever funding is still available, we can um, go ahead and, and issue that second round. So I'll, if you want me to open up to the commission for discussion or I'd like to proceed. I'm either way, I'm comfortable with, with it, John. Um, do my colleagues have any questions while he's on this slide? No, I just want to commend you for taking everything that we discussed prior. Um, attention to details, immaculate. So thank you. I think we hit the head on everything. Great. Anything else for my colleagues? <clears throat> Otherwise, John, let's just proceed. Perfect. Um, so determining a total funding amount allocated for the program, um, how much of our ARPA funds will we um, allocating to this uh, program? Um, John, you, prior to bringing this forward, there was already a number. Could you just remind us what that number was? Yeah, that was going to be $350,000. Um, there was some initial d discussion at the last meeting if that was going to be increased or decreased. I just wanted to finalize that number um, so we can allocate the appropriate amounts of the program. Um, as of right now, uh, just to get the conversation going, I'm comfortable with that number. And uh, you are going to do multiple rounds of funding, and so that will help us see if more is required or maybe not um, so as a starting point i'm comfortable with 350 and and then we'll watch how many people apply and so forth all right um, do any of my colleagues want to add anything to that commissioner hay based on uh previous historical data john i don't know if you have any where do most of our businesses fall in terms of I was looking at the gross uh, probably as uh, option three. Mm -hmm. Do you have a feel for for that? Uh, you can you can you can research it and, and let me know later. But I thought you might have an idea now. Um, I don't off the top, top of my head, but I'll be more than happy to, to do some research and and follow up with you on on what those numbers look like. It it really all depends on the on the previous companies that have applied to the programs to determine that, you know, what are their total gross sales. Um, so I wouldn't want to give you a number off the top of my head, but I'm more than happy to follow up with you. No problem. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Commissioner? Um, I mean, just to talk about the tiered systems, I, I think looking at, so option one is your gross revenue. And the idea of this is to assist, you know, businesses with loss of revenue um due to covid option two your net income you know if you're, if i'm a business owner i'm if my revenue is not where my target is i'm going to control my costs i'm going to control my cogs control my labor and everything else that's in between that top line and that bottom line um so i i, I just think that we could help more with option one i think we could do more in helping more businesses with option one because with option two if i'm a you know, hopefully I'm a good business owner, I'm controlling the in-between. And so I might not be eligible eligible because I was being responsible. And so I I would like, you know, I would propose option one as uh, as how, how we would move forward. Wonderful. And I would like to add um, through my research, the majority of other municipalities who have administered ARPA small business grants um, the majority of them do use uh, gross revenue as a percentage decrease. So the majority Excellent. of them do use option one. Excellent. Any, anything else, Commissioner? Nope, that's it. Anything else for my colleagues, uh, Vice yep. Mayor? Um, thank you, John. I know we met last week and we talked about there being a zero before and then how we should definitely have a one there. Thank you so much for making that change. Um, I actually happen to agree with the gross, uh, gross revenue um, 
percentage of loss for business owners. Um, I do have a question. Is it going to be, let's say, a business owner loss, like actual gross loss was, I don't know, $8,000 and the cap is $10,000 because they're between that one to 10%. Do we give them eight thousand dollars or do we give them ten thousand dollars? So if you're saying their total loss was only eight thousand dollars, they would get eight. They would get eight. Okay, correct. Perfect. That was what I wanted to. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, Commissioner Hay, anything anything to add while we have Mr. Durgan? No, you're good. All right, All right. Commissioner Kelly. Yeah, my only my comment was, I mean, I'm I let I agree with option one. I think that that captures. Um, what we're looking for my comment though was when john when you were asking about the total amount of funding and that was my recollection mayor from our previous conversation was because this because we had talked about we changed the numbers we gave we made it more um and that it was going to be this was going to be kind of a trial let's see how many people are are interested let's see what the need is um, at this point and then move forward from there um, as far as whether or not we need to uh, you know allocate more funding or not so that was my comment I know we're long past that but I got missed so oh, it's important making my points now, I'll be more than happy to if we do a round one I can bring a report back to the Commission um, that demonstrates how successful that round one was absolutely well, yeah and go ahead commissioner kelly yeah on that point john i was just going to say yes we would um i know i would like a report um and what is your timeline as far as um you know hitting the getting this on the ground and getting this started so that we know when we can expect to uh to see that timeline or to, to see the results and to see what's going on yeah great question so um to amend the program based off of um the eligibility requirements that are approved tonight as well as creating the application um that'll take a few days and you know we can have a, a timeline of probably sometime around next week um to build the application um build it online build that portal we want to test it to make sure everything runs smooth but um it's i think we can get it done by next week okay that's Good. great thank you commissioner turkin so you would say you can get it done by next week and then when could businesses start applying two weeks yeah so once we get the the application uploaded online the portal's open it's testing it and it works um we can start advertising next week so once it's open um we can do that um it would be great to to do some sort of outreach prior to where i can maybe potentially do um some sort of targeted outreach on what documents you need to submit kind of prepping everybody um for when the application portal does open up um everybody will be ready to go it'll run smoother we'll get the money out faster um it'll just be easier for everybody so if we have some time some leeway to to have some sort of targeted marketing outreach for the program i think that'd be extremely beneficial yeah. to answer my next question thank you yeah may my just my point to that um what are we have to of course think outside the box not every business is um is tech savvy not every business is online um so what are what's your plan you have um the business in brews that's a great opportunity for you to advertise this um because that is a citywide kind of encouraging event to get that word out but what else are you doing i know you're a kind of a one-man show so what are you doing uh to get the word out to people who aren't um you know aren't maybe online it's a great question um working with our marketing team uh on the outreach as far as social media in in newsletters what i can do it'll it'll take some more time but i can go visit businesses and, and go work with them again i don't know which ones are going to apply or um if they're eligible um but i can even offer um scheduling a workshop here on site at at, at city hall to kind of go over what those eligibility requirements are the documents so it'll, it'll give It'll create a space for people to come in person so i can walk them through what the process is going to be like what documents you need who's eligible who's not um, what that first round of funding looks like so i'll be more than happy to set up a workshop that may take a little bit more time for the application to open up but um, i'll be more than happy to do that okay. john that's an excellent idea and thank you commissioner for asking that question i'd just like to add that once you do that workshop uh, have that recorded let's post that online uh, so for anybody who can attend then they have that option as well yes sir all right. Uh, just to I'm follow sorry. up, Commissioner, one second. Uh, Vice sorry. Mayor Cruz has been sorry. waiting. So, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, as we talked about previously, um, just so that 
if anybody's watching here, like let's say any business owner, um, the requirements are going to be profit and loss statements, tax returns, and the W-9. Is that correct? Correct. W-9s, um, business tax receipts, BTR. So you have to be, you know, uh, an operating, uh, a legally operating business here in the city. W-9, um, any sort of bank statements you have that indicates that um, that loss in, in, in gross revenue um, and receipts, um, tax returns. Um, like you mentioned, profit and loss statements. Um, those are the main documents that um, we're going to be requesting, and those are going to be the ones that are most challenging as well. And uh, I've already spoken to a few business owners that are interested in applying to this grant, so it's good to know the requirement that if you've had any sort of COVID relief in the past, you will not be eligible for this. Um, but I think all of us, besides obviously social media, uh, newsletters, the city website, as well as word of mouth advertising, um, the commissioner for each district can, I guess, you know, work with you as a liaison to the local businesses, um, you know, within your district. There's, um, I already talked to you about one of the businesses that um, is interested in applying. Um, and then, as you mentioned, probably having one of those workshops would be super, super helpful, especially for the smaller businesses that might not have like, a, you know, the profit and loss statement per se. So we can maybe give them that opportunity to help them fill it out and yeah. That's all. thank you vice mayor and i appreciate that point because there are a lot of small businesses who may not have these things and so that's why they they have not been able to get any kind of support in the past and we can't leave them out as well commissioner hay oh yeah just a general question uh john this this is a lot of work right now do you feel comfortable being uh, the one-man show I know Dan will will help you out in any way he can, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you, you know this this is a a big big deal, and it, it's a lot of work involved here over the next uh, couple of weeks to try to get things ready to advertise and all this kind of stuff. Do you, do you feel comfortable with the with yes. your workload? Yes, sir. I'll be ready to go. Okay. Hired a John is uh, always assistant. ready. Tell us about your uh, assistant you hire. Well, we're in the process working with uh, HR to to get a marketing and outreach position that'll help specifically with economic development, um, which will be a huge help. And then we're working on um, the next position uh, this fiscal year. So hopefully in the beginning of, of, of the new year here, we'll have that, that second position as well. So, Excellent. Awesome. All right. Very good. Very good. Speaking of HR city manager, I think it's time for, not today, next meeting perhaps, <laughs> a formal introduction of our new HR director to the public. Uh, but we'll do that next meeting when there are more people. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you're not getting out of it. <laughs> Am I able to ask a question? Uh, yes, but not yet, Ms. Sawyer, problem. just one second. No problem. Um, is there anything else from my colleagues before we proceed? All right. Now, council, uh, there is no formal resolution or item before us. Just a consensus, is that correct? Well, I think if you're selecting an option, you should do it by motion. All right. And then we, we can do that. Make a motion to approve. Well, oh, one, okay. one second, ladies and gentlemen. Right, go ahead. Uh, because it's a final action uh, on the program and we do have a public comment speaker, I would like to hear public comments on this item. Ms. Oyer, yep. please begin when you're ready. Susan Oyer, Boynton Beach. I'd like to commend John for what appears to be a really outstanding job. Great job, very, it's obvious you put a lot of time and effort and work into this. Um, I don't really care which tier you pick. I care that you do something <laughs> so we can move this forward. My my issue is the marketing and thank you, Commissioner Kelly for addressing a lot of the marketing issue of this. Um, I, I think as many community leaders will tell you, people come to us all the time and ask us what's going on. They don't follow the city on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, if is anyone on Twitter, um, you know, Instagram, whatever, you know, they're, they are not tied into all this. They don't get the emails. They go to the spam. I mean, I can go for months without getting mine because they go to spam and you would think they wouldn't even because I even look at them. But what is our other option? Is there something where PNZ can send out something to everyone with a, a BTR? Is there like an email um, groups set up where you can push out this information because that might address some of these missing people that you were trying to address. And, you know, whether you're one person or 20 people trying to reach out to thousands of businesses is just absurd. 
So there's no way you can do that. You know, the 10 people that are going to show up to anything here or any workshops or the 50 people that may watch it on TV, which that's being generous, I think. Reality is, is there, well, let's face it, you know, um, this is only so much fun at 9.15 at night. Um, is, is there some way we, we have a, an email group listing and we can just push stuff out that way. And I would tend to say push it out to all the residents as well, just because that way they're probably working for someone in the city or know someone who has a business and we might be better able to capture everybody. So that would be my suggestion, but great job, John. I believe in, you know, saying good things when you deserve it. Great job, you know, pick whatever one's the right one and let's see these people get their money. Thank you. Mayor, if I could um, answer that, we do have an economic development newsletter email list, and that is every um, business that does have a BTR in the city. Um, their email that when they first applied for their BTR um, is on this on this list. So we have you know just over around 5,000 recipients on that list, and we're always updating it monthly when those new um, BTRs come in. So um, we do have that email blast. Thank you, Mr. Durgan. We have another public comment speakers in the chambers. Begin when you're ready. Hi, my name is Jim Sizek, uh, 705 Southwest 15th Street. Um, I apologize for belaboring this process. Um, I was frustrated the uh, the first time that this presentation was done. I thought you'd done a wonderful job putting everything together, and I'm not going to cut back on that. I think you did do wonderful analysis. My frustration at the point that this was first addressed, right off the bat, we eliminated everybody that had submitted any sort of request for funding. Nobody ever discussed urgency of need. I had this experience years ago and continuing for several years where I had to deal with minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, veteran owned businesses, where people said, uh, we've already gotten some from them. These were, we were trying to preserve small businesses and we eliminated them on an arbitrary determination that you can't ask again. If you're if you're really trying to settle in on those individuals in our community that are trying to develop something and trying to work through it, I understand that to the point where they have uh, wonderful resources at their disposal, where they 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 either are smart enough or they they can muster those piece of evidentiary uh, documents to support their claims. But I'm most concerned with those individuals that don't have that ability and those individuals that made a genuine effort at one point in the process still need it and are viable in our community and, and need to be considered. And again, because an arbitrary decision, they, they had submitted something once previously, we're not going to count on them. And I think we might possibly lose folks. And I don't know if you can absorb that into your, your analysis. You've done a wonderful job. But for me, urgency of need needs to be some sort of uh, some check on the system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you brought up an excellent point. John, did you want to respond to anything? Yes. Yeah, so um, what we're prioritizing as well as those who didn't receive any sort of assistance, not that, the, that they applied and didn't receive any, those who actually received um, funding um, that was COVID related. Um, so again, we're just we're bringing it back to the commission. If you would like us to prioritize those who haven't received any sort of funding, um, whether it's from the city, the CRA, um, or Palm Beach County, and that's not to take into consideration anything that were, that was received from the federal government, whether it was PPP or other um, bridge loans that were they were administered. This is strictly for those from the Boynton Beach CRA, the city, as well as Palm Beach County. Right, and I think that's where. The clarification is important. Uh, we prioritize those who have not received anything at all, right? Be for whatever reason, maybe they didn't have the proper paperwork, as Mr. Sizik has said, uh, but it does not actually exclude them, right? So they will still have that opportunity after we've done that round and still we have money and uh, then th then we'll open it up to a broader broader group. Absolutely, because that that need is still there. If if somebody received the 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 county's restart business grant back in in 2021, that money has since been long gone, and, and the need is still there. So absolutely. All right, thank you, um, Mr. Durgan. You've heard uh, numerous uh, amendments from 
members of the commission. Could you just repeat them to make sure that we are both absolutely on the same page? Yeah, so we are going to start with prioritizing those who have not received any sort of COVID relief by doing um, a first round of funding. Um, I can administer that for two months, 60 days. Um, and you're going to come back to us with the report. Absolutely. With an update. It doesn't have Correct. to be extensive. Yes, sir. Um, and then the, the total funding amount um, is the $350,000 that was previously approved. Um, the only um, outstanding item was going to be if there was going to be a cap on those businesses that were in the CRA district. Um, if we would cap a funding amount or if we could, um, or if they can apply in the second round versus the first round, I um, just wanted to bring that to the attention because the CRA did have um, over a million dollars in COVID relief that was administered. Um, so that was not eligible to those outside of the CRA. All right, colleagues, questions or thoughts on that item? Potentially capping the amount of funding for businesses within the CRA district. Commissioner Kelly? Well, I guess my, so my question is potentially capping the amount of funding for businesses within the CRA that have not received funding or that have, or, cause I think that that's kind of, it's, it's kind of vague because we can put a, the first round is strictly for prioritizing people that haven't received any, um, but then is the cap for all businesses in the CRA or just businesses that receive funding as, as opposed to, you know, eligible, you know, and, and I guess then you go down the rabbit hole of why didn't they receive any funding? Did they apply and the funding was run out and they were missed or did they not apply or did they apply and they were, uh, they didn't get the funding because they didn't, meet the qualifications or their application was incomplete. So I don't. Um, John, did you want to comment now? I know Vice Mayor wanted to add to that as well. Yeah, you, you, go ahead, Vice Mayor, do you just want to continue? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking to make it simple and whether you're in or out of the CRA area, if you've received any sort of COVID funding in the city of Boynton Beach, whether it's county or city, you would not be eligible for round one, you could be eligible for round two. I think that basically covers the entire city, if I'm not misunderstanding. Yeah, the, that was a, a great point, Commissioner Kelly. Um, the ones who are, the the companies that are in the CRA district that did not receive any, any funding, um, I think staff should recommend that they should be prioritized in that first round because they didn't receive any funding regardless if they were in the CRA or not. Um, so um, Vice Mayor, you, you made the point, um, prioritizing those regardless of if they're in the CRA or outside the CRA, if they didn't receive any sort of COVID relief funding prior to this, and they can be eligible for that for that round one. Right. So then the potential capping comes in af to the CRA businesses that have received, like, what are we capping, I guess, is the question, because are we capping any CRA business or are we just capping ones that have already received funding? So that's my question, because it's this sentence is just vague. So I just want to make sure that we're, are we cap? It says potentially capping the amount of funding for businesses within the CRA. Period. It doesn't say CRA who received funding or didn't receive funding or so I, I, I'm not comfortable with that sentence as it's worded, just because I don't think it's clear what CRA businesses we're talking about. So the CRA businesses that receive funding, they would be eligible for that round one. It'd be up to the commission if you wanted to cap the ones that did apply, like how many grants we, we, we can set aside, uh, an actual funding amount we can set aside for those in the in the CRA district. Um, again, the ones that did receive funding prior to, there was over, uh, not over, I think it was just about a million dollars issued just in the CRA district. So we can prioritize ones that have not received any funding, regardless if they're, they're in the CRA or outside the CRA for that round one. Round two, it's up to the commission. If you want to um, cap the uh, the actual dollar amount of funding we can issue to CRA businesses, or since that money, just like the people who were in the CRA has, has since gone, we, we, we wouldn't have to create some sort of cap system for that, for that round, the second round. 
Alternatively, um, we could always come back to this particular item because you are doing multiple rounds. So we could just proceed with round one, come back to us, we'll continue that discussion, we'll see how it went, and then, or, but I, I know there's more comments, Commissioner Turkin. Um, I, I think I agree with what Vice Mayor was saying. Let's just keep it simple. If you haven't gotten COVID relief funding, then you're up for this first round, whether you are or are not in the CRA district. I think you have the same sentiment or? Yeah, I just, I don't think this, I feel like, or I mean, maybe we just put off this sentence to say in any after the first round or something. Uh, right, right, exactly. So the first round is as what Commissioner has, Commissioner right. Turkin has just right. said. If you didn't get anything before, but regardless of where you are in the city, you are legible. You're going to come back with a report to us telling us how many people applied and so on. Now, the second round, we can address that next meeting in the interest of this evening's right. uh, duration, um, or we could hash it out right now and we can solve it. Can we? Uh, my preference is to move forward and uh, we can finalize that one particular point after we see the data. Yeah, I agree. Like we, the data. We, we can, yeah, exactly. Let's, let's just do round one first. Let's see how it goes just so we get the ball going and people can tap into the resources. Yes, sir. All right. Um, we do need a motion as uh, council just mentioned. Go I'm, ahead, Vice Mayor. I'm not understanding the confusion because maybe my brain doesn't work that way. Maybe I'm just, I just think differently. But I was thinking if any business anywhere in the city, whether you're in the CRA area on the east side of the city or not, mm -hmm. if you have received any sort of COVID relief, then you would not be eligible for phase one. Right, right. Which that's means that, saying. yeah, so. Exactly, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And then there will be a round two. confusion, excuse me. The okay. confusion was for round two, right? That's my understanding. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. I'll make that motion. Second. All right. We have a motion from commissioner. With option uh, one. 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 Yes, Please. this is the gross revenue year over year. And uh, John, do you have sufficient clarity in the direction? Yes, sir. All right. We have a motion from Commissioner Turkey, and I heard a second from Commissioner Kelly. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, and I'm very excited, and I'm glad we're able to help out this group of people who have not had any help thus yeah. far. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. This leads us to the final item for this evening. It is item 12B, proposed resolution number R23-009, approve and authorize the mayor to sign the declaration of restrictive covenant designating the future park site in the Meadows subdivision as green space. Um, council, uh, do you wanna add anything to this item? This is a legal matter. Only if you have questions, but this was put together at the direction of the commission to bring forward to you and the restrictive government was prepared by our office with the assistance of Andrew Mack and other members of staff to uh, put in the, uh, the the limited purpose. And it does would require a unanimous vote of the city commission to rescind this restrictive covenant. To rescind, but not to enact. That's correct. All right. Um, Commissioner Kelly, this was your item. And I know this is very important to you. It's your district. Uh, would you like to begin on this item? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I um, thank you, staff. Thank you to Mike for um, for getting this done. This is something that uh, came about um, from some meetings that I had um, and many communications that I had with uh, residents in my district um, with regard to this uh, city land. Um, and preserving it. This is uh, something that has been a, a, a green space for forever. And, and even after uh, the Meadows was built 25-ish years ago, um, it has stayed a green space. And it's something that, that the residents there have um, come to, to enjoy. Um, and uh, in continuing conversations with the residents. They're excited to see um, maybe some things that the city will will ultimately uh, do with this uh, land as far as 
planting trees. I don't know why a tree has never been planted on this land, um, but there is not a tree to be seen um, except for a, a barrier of, uh, of all kinds of overgrown uh, trees. So uh, trees and bushes. So I'm excited to see this happen. I think this is something that the residents have um, wanted um, and I'm, happy to have uh, been the person to to spearhead it for them. They, um, the residents there are, uh, they're a great group of people who are very proud of their neighborhood and they wanna see that it continues to be a green space and that no other potential development comes in. And so after lots of conversations with city staff, this is really probably the most protective way um, to make sure that that land does not get um, developed or changed. Uh, and so I'm excited about it. So that's my, um, you know, so we're excited to see what happens with it as far as building, you know, growing some trees and, and making use of it so that it doesn't, it's not just an empty lot, so. Excellent, thank you, Commissioner, for bringing this forward. I'd like to ask staff if we can get community greening to put some trees out there perfect site for that. Um, any other questions or comments from my colleagues to council, um, vice mayor? Just wanted to commend Commissioner Kelly for taking a bold step towards protecting your district, taking leadership and making sure that you do right by your constituents. I think that, you know, we're heading in the right direction um, as a commission and this is the first one, but it's not going to be the last one. Um, and definitely just wanted to thank you for taking that step, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. So thank you. Yeah. All right, anything else? Before we vote on this, I'd like to open this up for public comment. It is a resolution after all. Uh, let's begin with those in person after we'll go online. All right, if you would like to speak on this item, now is the time to approach the podium. Seeing none, in-person public comments are now closed. Mani, is there anybody online? Who would like to speak on this item? Mr. May, we have no hands raised. All right, public comments in general are now closed on this item. We have a motion to approve resolution number R23-009. So moved. Second. There was a motion <laughs> from Commissioner Kelly, and I'm not really sure who said a second. Let's go with Commissioner Turkin. All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. This concludes all the items on the agenda. Are there any final comments from my colleagues as we adjourn this meeting? Is there anything else? Final comments? Happy New Year again to everybody. And I'm excited for uh, a new year and all the things that will come out of 2023. Thank you again. We have a motion to adjourn. So move. We have second. a motion and a second. Aye. <laughs> This meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Oh, we're quick.